Animals there. Good evening. This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Kayla Drummond. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Xfinity Channel 73 and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the November 7th agenda. Dr. Rogers, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any additions or changes to this evening's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matters that affects one or more specific individuals, and consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under the board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good, Good evening. evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, <laughs> Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, terminations, resignations, leaves, deceased recognition of service, and certificate appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit D1? So moved from Paul. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Domanowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Do I have a motion to approve the personal matters as presented in exhibits D2 through D5? So moved from Pong. Thank you. Any, do I have a second? Second, Stileski. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Good evening, Madam Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointment for your approval. Principal Wellwood International School. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointment as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved from Pong. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Harvey. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Dr. Rogers. And for this evening's appointment, I'd like to ask Alana Thompson to please rise. <laughs> Alana Thompson is attending this evening with her husband, William Thompson. 
she is being appointed to the position of Principal Wellwood International School. With 11 years of experience in Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experience include classroom teacher at Scotts Branch and Edmondson Heights Elementary Schools, teacher academic engagement at Edmondson Heights Elementary School, and assistant principal at Wood Home Elementary School. Congratulations. And her, her former principal is right behind her, so very, <laughs> Ms. McDivitt is. And Wellwood holds a dear place in my heart. It's where I attended elementary school, so congratulations. Okay, now I got so excited, I lost track of where I am. Okay. <laughs> Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by her staff. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. The Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and the Office of School Safety has recommended the following safety and security protocols. Participants should be seated in the room during meetings. Individuals who need to stand should go into the hallway to do so. Participants should not approach the table unless called upon to speak and should not approach the dais. Materials brought to the table are limited to electronic devices, presentation papers, and posters no larger than 11 by 14 inches. Other items should be left in your seats. Documents to be given to the board or to be handed to the staff member who is seated in the front area of the meeting. Information for other attendees is to be left on the designated table outside in the hall. In the event of an emergency that requires an emergency response, such as a lockout, lockdown, or evacuation, staff from the Office of School Safety will direct participants. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Disparaging or derogatory remarks towards students and staff will not be tolerated. Inappropriate personnel remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of the time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. I now call our, on our school system affiliated groups to speak. Our first speaker is Edwin Perez, speaking on behalf of the PTA Council of Baltimore County. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Edwin Perez. I'm a member of the Baltimore Latino community. I'm co-chair of the TAPCO Minority Affairs Committee, and I'm a dedicated educator at Parkville High School, where along with my colleagues, we work daily to support our Baltimore County area youth and their families. Tonight, I'm here as representative of the Multilingual Community Partnership, MLCP, which is a new initiative <coughs> under Baltimore County Council of the PTA. As you may recall, Ms. Leslie Weber, president of the Baltimore County Council of the PTA, has spoken about this initiative in a previous board meeting. At the MLCP, we are partners, we are advocates, and we are advisors. As a member organization of the National PTA, we also support the safety, protection, and well-being of all our students, including our black, brown, multilingual, multicultural, international immigrant, and LGBTQIA plus youth. We at the MLCP want to serve as partners with the Board of Education, with members of Baltimore County Public Schools, and with the students, parents, families, and community partners within the greater Baltimore County area. Our mission is to serve as your advisors in the areas related to ELL, English language learners, the seal of biliteracy, and multilingualism. 
Our vision is to work alongside our multilingual, multicultural, immigrant, and international youth and their families and provide support for them towards achieving greater success as they navigate the complexities of our school system. The MLCP recognizes the work that the Board of Education and Baltimore County Schools has already done to complete in these aforementioned areas, but as we all know, more work needs to be done. Through policy and advocacy, the MLCP can work with partners in support of policies leading to competitive wages, increased benefits, and better court working conditions for school employees. Through employment policy work, the MLCP can work with partners to improve recruitment and retention of certified ELL, ESOL, and world language educators. Through the creation and implementation of inclusive language policies, the MLCP can partner with BCPS to support Office of World Language Seal of Bioliteracy initiatives that help our students in earning a professional recognition that declares their world language proficiency, proficiency on their high school transcript. Through the support of academic language study, the MLCP can partner with the Office of World Languages and support an increase of world language course offerings, thus helping prepare students for a multilingual professional opportunities and multicultural community spaces. And through professional development, the MLCP can connect with BCPS trainers to provide the necessary training resources and support for staff that work with international students and language learners within their school programs. In closing, I want to thank you for your time tonight, and I invite you to join the work of the MLCP. Let's work together to help build bridges across cultures, across languages, and support our BCPS multilingual youth, staff, and families. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Next are our unions, and our first speaker is Cindy Sexton on behalf of TABCO. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Rogers, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. A quick mention of our ongoing negotiations and the desire of both TABCO and the school system to complete them by November 30th. We need to finish strong by being sure we are doing what we can to retain our educators and deal with the discipline concerns that interrupt the education of our students. Let's please be sure we work collaboratively to address both and finish on time. But I must speak up, up, speak up and speak out for our marginalized students. Our transgender, our non-binary, gender non-conforming students need us to support and protect them. They report repeated harassment and violence at school. Were many of us bullied in school? Probably, I know I was. But it has escalated and become much more targeted for our LGBTQIA students. What is clear is that we must support and protect these students. There are so many forces in our society now that can make us feel unsafe. School must be a safe place for our students and staff. Let us not find ways to make it more difficult for them, but ways to support them and help them in their journeys so our schools, community, and society can be kinder, more accepting, caring places. Students can't learn if they don't feel safe. TAPCO stands at the ready to do the work with you, Dr. Rogers, your team, and this board. Let us support all young people to be their authentic selves and pursue their dreams. Thank you. Thank you. Next are our nonprofit community groups, and our first speaker is Tara Thompson on behalf of Moms for Liberty, Baltimore County. Are they all on? Yes. Oh, Good evening. Good evening. Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Rogers, and members of the board, thank you for having me. I would like to formally introduce our organization to all of you. Moms for Liberty is a nonpartisan, nonprofit, grassroots organization. Our national organization is rep represented in 48 states with over 300 chapters and over 150,000 members with 10 chapters here alone in Maryland. We were founded in 2021 in response to a growing need to address and uphold parental rights in education that were being lost all over the country. Our schools were closed, our children's faces were masked behind plexiglass partitions, Politics came creeping in, and learning loss was imminent. We are seeing the result of that now years later. Our parental concerns are constantly overshadowed by lobbyists and teachers unions who take a seat at the table time and time again and push parents' voices aside. 
I would like to briefly talk about two very important BCPS topics tonight that do affect parental rights. First, I would like to address and loop back to the curriculum meeting from 1023 in regards to the book and curriculum section selection and review process. It was stated that BCPS will be reviewing the differences between curriculum resources in the classroom and library resources. Thank you for addressing the pressing need to dif differentiate this. New language, however, was presented that does not protect parental rights in terms of the checkout process of books that some parents do not want their children having access to. It's wonderful that a parent can email the school librarian and request that their child is not given access to certain books. However, this is negated when the new language states that the child will still be able to view and check them out digitally. It also doesn't address the fact that they are still physically accessible to the child on the actual library shelf. Please address this when a clear policy is written. No access should mean no access. Parents want to trust the process and the system, and this needs to be addressed. Second, I would like to address the LGBTQ plus guidance. I want to make it clear to everyone that the use of restrooms, locker rooms, and sports teams by the opposite sex is guidance. No law is forcing BCPS to put this into place. Therefore, you will bear the sole responsibility when any child is potentially hurt due to the guidance that you have put in place. There are many, many children who are not being considered in this guidance. Please consider putting a policy in place that protects all children. Safe spaces must be safe for our boys, girls, and those questioning their sex. We don't take away one safe space to give it to another. We create safe spaces for all. And as we know, that looks different for several children, not just a few. Please consider adopting a policy that guarantees rights of biological girls and boys while providing non-stigmatizing alternatives for those boys and girls whose gender identity differs from their biological sex. Schools are not qualified to, protect, to practice gender medicine, but they can certainly use common sense to keep all of our children safe. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barbara Desmond from Randallstown NAACP. <coughs> Good evening, Dr. Desmond. Good evening. Board members, members of the board, Madam Chair, Madam Co-Chair, Vice Chair. Um, as you know, I am, and I'm not gonna be shy, I know what I'm talking about a great deal more. I'm responsible for state becoming number one, and many of the programs that I designed or implemented in this system led in the implementation were responsible for this becoming one of the best systems in the nation. Therefore, I'm speaking from that context. Um, I'm not, and I did meet with certain people, the superintendent, and I met with um, um, Dr. DiDonato, and I was impressed with both of them. Um, I left the system. One time I stood in this board meeting and I chastised the president of the board and told him that he was going to be responsible for what would happen to this county in the future if we did not uh, um, recognize the demographic shift and do what needed to be done for uh, minority students, et cetera. And um, it wasn't done. So I come before you tonight to remind you as board members of your fiduciary responsibility because you chose to be here as leaders and that the job is more than selecting a superintendent and waiting. Um, I warned of dire consequences and they're going to start within the schools and now they're going to spread into the county which has already begun. Um, we, lately some of our NAACP members met with representatives from your curriculum department, specifically English language arts, and we talked about the curriculum program into reading, and we also talked about professional development. When we asked about certain aspects of the end of reading program, we were told that it had been vetted. When given details such as being vetted since February, the vetting did not include a research basis, et cetera, or its impact on student achievement. Therefore, and I'm gonna pass this out to you, we were shocked when, um, I was shocked to see a letter from the English Language Arts Department that, and the paragraph is there, that says, 
um, we have three main goals for this curriculum field test, to have a research-based vertically and horizontally aligned ELL curriculum to fully vet what resources have to offer. Um, this isn't accurate. And I said when I came here, if you remember a couple of months ago, that should I find a case like this again, I would come back to you. And I will continue to do that. This is not true. Also, standard English, please. We need the standard English resolution was passed by the board. Here's some suggestions. Bring back cursive. You see the digital gap, and they're ignoring it. The teachers need it. And also, keep parents better informed and <coughs> prepare to change grading practices to be more standards based, not project. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. And who oh, got this to? Thank you. Next are individual citizens and student groups. And our first speaker is Sharon Serhoff. Is she there, Ms. Serhoff? Ms. Serhoff, are you there? Okay, I'm going to go to the next one. If we get her on, we'll come back. Um, our next speaker is uh, Vanessa Farah. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, board members, good evening. I appreciate this opportunity to address you today. I stand here today on behalf of many Baltimore County moms to speak on a matter of great significance, one that we must examine through the lens of our constitution, history, and morality. This approach grounded in our core values can guide us through the challenges we face right here in Baltimore County. The principles protected in our Constitution are the foundation of our democracy, safeguarding our rights to privacy and safety, and providing a defense against government overreach under any cause. As James Madison wisely said once, the rights of individuals must be protected against infringement by any government under any excuse. History is on our side in this matter. Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 was established to ensure that no person in the United States on the basis of sex shall be excluded, denied benefits, or subjected to discrimination in any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. The original and existing Title IX regulations recognize the physiological differences between male and female sexes, an objective scientific fact that is essential to education. Denying the reality of biological sex undermines the very foundation upon which education rests. Encouraging encounters between opposite sex students in bathrooms, locker rooms, and showers could lead to anxiety, bullying, and potential sexual harassment and abuse, which school authorities are entrusted to prevent. Forcing students to use facilities which members of the opposite sex violates their rights to privacy and subjects them to situations most adults would find objectionable. We, shall not, we should not allow any ideology to jeopardize the well-being of our young girls or violate their rights. This is not a political issue. It's a moral and safety issue. And it's our duty as responsible citizens to advocate for the rights and well-being of our children. We ask this board to consider the gravity of the situation at hand and make decisions based on a solid understanding, compassion, and respect for the unique needs of all our students. Let us reaffirm our support for Title IX of the Education Amendments. This commitment to protecting our children's rights is not only constitutional, but also deeply moral. 
Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ashley Stivers. Our next speaker is MJ Fracker. Good evening, board. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity for me to share my views on safety with education. And that is, I'm gonna drill down to the female gender. I'm very concerned about an article that was published in the Dundalk Eagle newspaper of an incident that happened in General John Stricker Middle School, which I have right here, where a young boy threatened the young girls that were at the uh, restrooms, that he would tase them and then in turn he would rape them inside of the restrooms. So my whole point is this, that as females that are wanting to go to school to learn and become leaders like you are right here on the board, they are now totally I'm sorry, they're just sidetracked with focus. They're having to stay in the classroom holding their bladder because they're so afraid of going to the bathroom and what would happen to them. And there are girls that when they're on their menstrual cycle, they can't change their, their tampons. And I know another girl that is actually using her, na her sanitary napkin to go to the bathroom because she's so concerned about going to the bathroom and what would happen. And so then she's so focused at school, not getting the lesson because she's so concerned about her safety. So I'm asking you board, would you please consider taking measures to ensure that these bathrooms are secure and that our girls can become leaders. Just like when I was watching that movie, Hidden Figures, those three women, they were so powerful in that movie, and yet there was one that she had to hold her bow to the end of the day or try to get over to the other building so that she could do her work. These girls need to be leaders and you need to show them what it's like to be a leader and that they had the freedom and the security, the safety at school to learn and to be what they're supposed to be leaders not only just for today but leaders for tomorrow your your daughters your granddaughters there is they are needed in this country we need to have a voice and I'm being the voice for these females today I know that there are males uh, in our school as well but me as a female I have been hindered myself and I want all these girls to have the freedom and the liberty to learn in a, in a place that's safe and secure for them and I'm just asking you would you please consider Please consider and don't let the female gender be put under and not have a voice and grow and be the leaders that we need them to be and break this ceiling so they can be everything that they were designed to be. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Serhoff, are you there? I think I heard her a little bit before. Ms. Serhoff? I think you're there. <laughs> Ms. Serhoff? <laughs> Ms. Serhoff? Ms. Serhoff, are you there? Oh, we know you're there. Can you? Do you want to say your comments? Bless you. Okay. Okay, I'm going to keep going and we'll try again. Um, our next speaker is Ms. Adams. Good evening. Good evening, board members and Dr. Rogers. I'm here this evening to continue a conversation about the reading curriculum, excuse me, about curriculum decisions being made by staff and what is exactly communicated to parents. We have some questions. So there was a recent post from a board member who visited an elementary school to observe the use of a mirror in the classroom. But the statement does not address the teacher and parental concerns that we've heard related to the accuracy of the AI screening program. We understand the need to help teachers be more efficient and more effective, 
but the Ready to Read law was written to identify foundational skill deficits and remediate them. There is concern about the ease of use and the accuracy of AMIRA screening results and the content being given to students and the lack of focus on decoding text to mastery and with comprehension. How is BCPS addressing these concerns to be in compliance with the remediation according to state law? The intention of Ready to Read Act was to focus on foundational literacy early. Should it take two months to complete these screenings? Following this timeline, the teachers lost two months' time the entire first quarter um, and were not able to address the skill gaps. Last year, BCPS's end of year data for kindergartners showed that 36% were still not meeting benchmarks. Shouldn't that number be closer to 15% at the end of the year or less? Second, board members, do you know that there's a public notice for BCPS to purchase a research-based summer learning program that includes summer literacy and math curriculum, contract CWA 112-24? Do you know where it is found on the BCPS website to, um, for public notice? And if not, if you don't know where it is, how does, should the public find it? It's currently on the procurement website. Um, why is there a need to purchase a completely different summer learning program for math and ELA? Don't we have a new high-quality evidence-based ELA program in addition to Open Court, Hegarty, and OG? For math, don't we have millions invested in bridges? Do all of these different curriculum have the same scope and sequence and what of what is taught during the school year or will it require more training for teachers? Last week, the parents at a local middle school were informed about a field test of a new secondary ELA curriculum called HMH into Literature. We're seeing a pattern. Are we perhaps being swayed by a very effective sales team to invest all in one company who has a minimal quasi-experimental research and case studies to support their products? Staff is telling the board that this is an approved product, but when the public digs in, we can see a lack of evidence on student outcomes. We have now invested millions into HMH elementary curriculum, HMH reading intervention, and now 500,000 into a field test of a secondary curriculum. We're entering budget season where the superintendent is soliciting feedback from the community. We hear about fiscal cliffs. When is spending going to end and accountability going to begin? As a large school system are, with potentially deep pockets, are we being targeted? We need more than a 1 to 1.2 percent That's Thank you. Um, Ms. Serhoff, I'm going to try again. Ms. Serhoff, I know she's putting stuff in the chat. Ms. Gover, she can. Okay, well, she can, if she can speak, she... She said she can't hear anything. Okay, do you want to type it, tell her to go? Just go start away. talking. Go away or what? Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, at this, okay, um, we'll try one more time. We do have one space open. Um, let me, since there are speaker, speaker spaces available, we will now call from the wait list for the individual citizens and student category. So the first speaker from the wait list is Eric Morris. Good evening, Mr. Morris. Individual citizens and Okay, can you hear me now, Ms. Lifter? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Go, go for it. Ms. Lifter, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Okay, can you hear me now, Ms. Lifter? Yes. I can hear you go, go for it. Okay. Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you Speak of some of these concerns last night at the CCAC meeting. My concern is that we're saying that special education is a priority, but we're not trying to identify individuals' disabilities. 
we are refusing to we are refusing to evaluate students even in areas that it is blatantly obvious that they need to be evaluated in and unless a parent uh, sometimes contacts an advocate those areas do not get evaluated and when a, even when a parent has an advocate I have a couple of situations right now going on um, and I have requested um, on the parents behalf an independent evaluation of public expense because you're refusing to evaluate the child with your in-home people um, the response is well we'd rather take you to court and waste county money and waste county time then provide that evaluation um, and I think that this is a very concerning item because we really should be trying to evaluate these kids and see whether or not they actually need services as opposed to fighting not to give them services uh, the other thing is that we are now turning some services into consults and the perfect example is the item of assistive technology that used to be a full-blown evaluation we looked at different areas now it's a consult and we don't even bother to tell the administration or the IEP chair that we're in the building and find out what we're supposed to be evaluating so these are concerns that need to be addressed now and not when Baltimore County gets around to it because it's impacting kids ability not just now but down the road thank you thank you our next speaker from the wait list is Eric Morris try this take two <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, members of the board. Um, I'm Eric Morris, a proud BCPS employee, but here tonight I am uh, visiting you again to speak about the need for strong policies supporting LGBTQ plus students of all ages like two of my three children. At the last board meeting, I spoke of the great supports that my, children, uh, that my children's high school offered to them, um, my transgender children specifically. But those staff members don't have to do, give this support. Uh, they do it because they care about their students and they care about LGBTQ plus students. These are the students who every day live their lives in fear to be their true selves and fearful of these hate groups persecuting them. One of those specific hate groups, Moms for Liberty, is making statements that our trans students are creating unsafe environments for their children when in fact they are the perpetrators of that fear and they are creating the unsafe environments for those children. I call them a hate group because for the foremost authority on identifying these groups, the Southern Poverty Law Center has added them to their hate groups list. Please, I beg you not to listen to these words of hate, lies, and division these groups are spewing. And listen to the words of love, compassion, and equality and equity from groups like the ACLU, NAACP, PFLAG, GLSEN, and our very own teachers union, TABCO. Once again, I ask you, I implore you, the board, the elected officials, the leaders of BCPS, to reread these LGBTQ plus guidelines and call for a vote to make those guidelines district policy or rules. Or better yet, put together a special committee to plan a new inclusive policy a committee made of teachers and staff, administration and parents, students and these outside LGBTQ plus expert organizations to put together the best policies to protect our LGBTQ children. Thank you for your time and efforts for students, for all students. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, 
members of the board. Tonight, I am pleased to share the superintendent's report with you. Put up the slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. We want to begin by again announcing that we are excited that budget season has started this year. Uh, we know moving forward for the next fiscal year, it will be a challenging season. However, we are trying uh, very uh, hard to make sure that we share with all stakeholders our process for developing the budget to propose to the Board of Education. Uh, we have had the opportunity to engage in several community conversations around the budget. This week we will be at Parkville High School, and next week our last and fifth community session will be at Western Tech High School, and so we invite the community to come out. Uh, we also are proud to announce Budget 101 on our website. Uh, this provides an in-depth view of how we allocate our spending, what our funding sources are, and we want to take a few minutes um, just in case you haven't had an opportunity um, to receive a brief overview of our operating budget uh, to give you a quick look. So if we can go ahead and play the video. vision to be among the highest performing school systems in the state and the nation our purpose to increase achievement for all students and prepare students to thrive in college career or the military every day bcps welcomes and engages more than 110,000 students in 176 schools programs and centers our students staff parents and community members are the heart of this school system and our work is driven by their boundless potential. We work hard to provide the instruction, services, and opportunity Team BCPS students need to be successful and thrive in the future. We do this through our operating budget, which pays for the staff, resources, and materials our schools need. It is important that our community understands how the BCPS operating budget is developed and funded and how the money is spent. Work on the operating budget for the next fiscal year typically begins in the summer with a preliminary estimate completed by early fall. After considering all requests from BCPS offices and reviewing recommendations from schools, executive leadership and stakeholder groups, the superintendent submits a proposed budget to the Board of Education in January. The proposed operating budget is a reflection of our values, high expectations for students and staff, and commitment to pursuing excellence in all areas of our work. The board holds public hearings to gather comments and feedback from the community and then works to finalize their budget proposal, which is submitted to the Baltimore County Executive and the County Council. The council also holds a public hearing and approves a budget for the county, which includes BCPS. The board approves a final budget for BCPS in May. 48% of the total BCPS budget comes from Baltimore County government. Nearly 38% of the budget comes from the state and almost 14% comes from federal and other sources. The vast majority of the BCPS operating budget goes into the classroom. For every dollar in our budget, more than 63 cents is spent on instruction, including teachers, principals, staff, and instructional materials. About 15 cents of every dollar goes to other services for schools, like bus transportation for more than 80,000 students a day, nutritious meals, and support staff, including social workers, psychologists, custodial, and maintenance workers. About six cents of every dollar is spent on central office staff. Our central office team does critical work, including hiring, teacher and staff training, and providing direct support and oversight to our 176 schools, programs, and centers. Overall, nearly 83% of the BCPS operating budget goes to pay for salaries and benefits to support and retain our outstanding team BCPS staff members. The BCPS operating budget lays out the strategies we will use to achieve our goals and matches them with the investments we need to implement the strategy. Our collective efforts and strategic investments will help make BCPS a premier system in Maryland. It's 
special thanks to BCPS TV for putting together uh, that video. Again, we invite all members of Team BCPS to learn more about our operating budget and the process overall by visiting Budget 101 on our website. Next slide, please. For the next portion of the update, would like to provide an overview of where we are with the transition team report. Um, I provided to the board uh, the final recommendations where we had short-term and re uh, long-term recommendations uh, provided to us as a school system. Next slide, please. We identified our next steps, which included uh, cabinet and divisions to review the short-term recommendations and to decide on the next steps. That step is complete. Uh, the actual uh, Excel document will be posted on our website tomorrow. And within 60 days, implementation of accepted short-term recommendations, we are in progress. The next few slides uh, share a few updates on where we are with specific areas of the transition report. Next slide, please. In regards to teaching and learning, um, we have taken several actions consistent with the recommendations. Specifically, uh, we have started a systemic professional development for teachers and leaders in the areas of ELA, mathematics, special education, and ESOL, both school-based and central office-based, with a plan for the entire year. Um, our Office of Division of Human Resources has a comprehensive recruitment and retention plan, including expanded partnerships uh, with universities, uh, support for our new teachers and our conditionally certified teachers and um, stay focus groups to find out that our teachers who stay with us, what are the reasons why they stay so we can make sure that we expand that and that we are able to retain uh, particularly our uh, new teachers to BCPS and not lose them within the first three years. And lastly, we have started our superintendent's instructional leadership team, central office meetings where we meet across offices and divisions to really focus on our student um, uh, data and to identify ways that as central office we can support our schools uh, directly. Next slide, please. In the area of culture and climate, um, you, Everyone can expect quarterly staff advisory group meetings with all chiefs uh, for us to gain input and perspective on curriculum implementation, professional learning, and any questions and concerns that impact members of Team BCPS. Uh, we continue to meet with community stakeholders and elected officials. Uh, several FY25 operating budget forums have been scheduled. Uh, three out of five have occurred. We also have operating budget uh, forums with our area advisory councils and, of course, with the Board of Education. Um, a work group of external partners, central office staff, and building leaders to examine and enhance our safety protocols. Uh, this work has started and will continue throughout the year as we continue to focus on making sure all, that our, all of our schools and offices are safe. Student focus groups will um, help us. We are uh, soliciting uh, feedback and input from our high schools to ensure that our students are able to help us identify issues that they are facing in real times and potential enhancements to our work moving forward. And lastly, we are working on reviewing and updating our comprehensive safety plan as a school system. <coughs> Next slide. In the area of community engagement and communication, we are offering sessions on effective communication and community engagement for our leaders across the school system, both on the school side and operations. We have started this year Central Office Professional Leadership Development monthly uh, sessions, and that is for our operations teams. A Stay Connected campaign to provide communication team uh, tools to all members of Team BCPS stakeholders in a variety of ways, focus groups, specifically with our Spanish-speaking parents and community advocacy groups, as well as support of our mobile uh, ESOL Welcome Center, and continue to meet with our new principals to provide communication support and training to respond to the recommendations to ensure that across the system that we are modeling open, effective communication with all of our stakeholders. Next slide, please. In the area of infrastructure, uh, we have hired the project manager to uh, 
lead the overall uh, project for our ERP enterprise resource planning system. Uh, we have a partnership with the uh, AIB to create and distribute information regarding the career ladder and opportunities for our teachers, and we are providing national board certification support um, to ensure that we're increasing our recruitment efforts, we're providing monthly information sessions, and hosting school visits to share the benefits of becoming a nationally board certified teacher. Next slide. And for the final area of the transition plan operations, we have already started the data analysis and mapping with the, of the new system with the ERP vendor. We will have a presentation to the Board of Education upcoming in November specifically on um, our uh, new product. Uh, to share with everyone our progress and anticipated outcomes. And uh, additionally, leadership from the Office of Transportation and Division of Operations, our meetings uh, with leaders throughout the state on student safety initiatives related to school vehicles, including stop arm camera options and implementation as recommended by the transition uh, plan. And so specific details regarding all of the actions and all of the recommendations, again, will be posted on the website uh, tomorrow. And so we invite members of Team BCPS um, to take a look uh, to see our progress consistent with the recommendations of the transition report. Before we come to a close, we do want to provide an update. Uh, previous slide, please. We do want to provide an update and a reminder to members of our community around safety and climate. As you know, we identified four main priorities for our school system for the year, with safety and climate being paramount. Uh, ensuring the safety of all of our staff and our students is extremely important to us. Uh, we have found uh, two uh, areas where we want to remind our uh, members of Team BCPS to help to support our efforts around this effort. Um, specifically, threats to schools, uh, false threats to school violence, uh, those are uh, frightening to staff members as well as frightening to students and parents. Uh, it is extremely serious. We engage with our partners, uh, Baltimore County Police Department, uh, as well as other agencies around the clock to make sure that schools and school communities are safe. Um, it is important to note that after an exhaustive uh, investigation, when we find that students are engaging in purposeful uh, threats of violence um, for dares or just for fun uh, that interrupt uh, normal school operations, that not only are the uh, police department moving forward with pressing charges as a school system, we are availing ourselves of all appropriate disciplinary consequences. And again, a reminder, we shared this in October uh, with reference to weapons in schools in direct um, alignment with federal law and state law, gun-free schools. Uh, any student that is um, in possession of a weapon on school property will be expelled for the minimum of a year, um, in addition to charges from the uh, police department. And so we need to keep our schools safe. Our number one priority is to make sure that we are educating all of our students, and that requires all of us to make a commitment to keeping our schools safe. And so I thank in advance all of our community members for helping us to move forward with keeping our schools safe. And finally, we want to thank everyone uh, for all of their time and efforts. As we close the first quarter, it has been a strong first quarter. Our students are doing well. Our staff members are energized. And we're looking forward to um, three more quarters where we continue to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Next on the agenda is the chair report, and I call on me. So um, good evening. One of the themes that the Board of Ed heard during the superintendent's search last spring was the immediate and pervasive need for increased communication by BCPS's superintendent. This theme was reinforced many times in many ways by various stakeholder groups, both external and internal. Dr. Rogers demonstrated ready 
demonstrating right from the beginning that she takes stakeholder feedback seriously, has made significant strides in this effort to improve communication, coordination, and collaboration across the system. Following her eight community meet and greets and multiple meetings with the county executive, county council, and members of the Baltimore County delegation, she has had monthly press conferences, community conversations on the operating budget, two community meetings focused on special ed, and as recently as last night, she participated in an in-person and CCAC Special Ed Citizens Advisory Committee meeting. I encourage the public to take advantage when these opportunities occur to learn more about BCPS and to hear directly from our superintendent and to provide input and feedback. So thank you, Dr. Rogers, for taking very tangible steps to improve communication with all members of Team BCPS. And we look forward to your continued engagement with our diverse community. As a board member, it's hard to believe that we're entering the fiscal year 25 budget season. Baltimore County Public Schools has a $2.58 billion operating budget that funds the operations of 176 schools, programs, and centers, and provides for the academic and social-emotional needs of more than 111,000 students. Many Board of Ed members were extremely new on the board last year or had not yet been appointed when the budget season started last year. We learned quickly that the budget process requires learning, homework, and preparation from board members. This year, for the first time, our student member of the board will be voting on the budget, and you're going to hear more about her preparation during an upcoming report tonight. I strongly encourage members of the community to get involved in the budget process as the board prepares to receive Dr. Rogers' proposed budget recommendation in January. There are two more budget conversations left that you are invited to attend this Thursday at Parkville High School and on the 14th at Western School of Technology. During these conversations, Dr. Rogers provides an overview of the budget process, engages participants in conversation about community priorities, and answers questions from attendees. Also, there is a very informative Budget 101 webpage that provides an overview of the BCPS operating budget, where our funding comes from, how it's spent, and how we ensure we are meeting the needs of every BCPS student. Please consider using this website to learn more about the BCPS budget process. Last week, as one of our speakers um, alluded to, Ms. Dominowski and I had the chance to visit Oliver Beach Elementary School to learn more about the new literacy screening tool, Amira. Um, for those of you who knew me or worked with me in a previous life, you know that I was a huge supporter of Dibbles as a screener for our youngest learners. Amira, while a screener, also provides a practice component that Dibbles did not include. My purpose in visiting Oliver Beach was to observe the program being used directly by students and to learn the practice component of the program. My biggest takeaway um, was first how much I missed being in the classroom with, with small children. But after that, my biggest takeaway was a number of students that I observed reading, especially in grades one through three. And they were reading while the teacher was providing small group instruction to other students. As a former teacher and principal, I know that often when teachers are trying to provide small groups of students with targeted instruction, the other students are giving work to do that may not be as meaningful or as robust as it needs to be, but it does allow the teacher to focus on the students in her small or his small group. Or students may be reading text, but they're not provided immediate feedback and therefore are not truly practicing um, reading fluency, but rather going through those motions of reading. I also realize that teachers spend a lot of time creating this work when their efforts could be planning the instruction that they are providing to directly to students. Again, the biggest positive takeaway that I had was the large number of students that I observed in all classrooms reading. Is it meeting the needs of all of our students? There is not a single program that we can use that will do that. But it does appear to be a user-friendly tool for teachers to be able to provide students with a wide range of materials on their reading level, to practice and receive immediate feedback. Yes, it does do that. From the differentiated content being, content being provided to the ways in which the program provides additional support when students stumble on a word or words, to watching students charting their own progress, to the teacher's ability to listen to students read to obtain instructional implications, I was pleased to see the potential of this new tool, especially after only one quarter of implementation. I look forward to learning more about this tool and its impact on the system's efforts to strengthen student literacy and boost academic achievement. 
I'd also like to thank Oliver Beach's principal, Lynn Palmer, her staff and students for opening their doors to Ms. Dominowski and me last week and allowing us to learn more about this new program. Lastly, I'd like to re remind Team BCPS that American Education Week takes place next week from November 14th through the 17th. And it would be great to see parents in our schools supporting the work of our students, our staff, and our administrators. Also, please consider signing up for a November conference with your child's teacher or teachers, no matter how little or big that child may be. Conferences are a great way to get to know your child's teacher as well as send a strong message to your child about the collaboration between home and school. I'd also like to wish our vice chair a very happy birthday and thank her for spending her special day with us. And next, <laughs> <woo -hoo! laughs> uh oh. And next, okay, thank you. And next on the agenda is our student member of the board's report. And for that, I call Ms. Drummond. Good evening. I wanted to start off by announcing this Thursday, November 9th at 6 p.m., our Board of Selected Students and myself will be holding our first Smob Town Hall of the Year using the Google Meet code SMOB Town Hall, all capitals. This is an opportunity for all secondary students to engage with me, ask questions, and share thoughts. Town halls will be hosted monthly. Next, this Saturday, November 11th, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., um, Miracles and More Outreach is hosting a youth summit in participation with Baltimore County Police Department, Baltimore County Public Schools, NAACP of Baltimore County, and other partners at Newtown High School. It's a free event for ages 10 through 18. This event will feature youth and adult panels, vendors, music, snacks, and giveaways. Please find registration information on BCPS social media. Lastly, the SMOB applications will be opening in December. Please keep an eye out on the SMOB webpage and social media for more information. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Drummond. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of the proposed 2024-2025 school calendar. And for that, I call on Ms. Charlie Green and Ms. Bilski. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Board Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Rogers, members of the Board of Education. Tonight, I, along with our Manager of Staff Relations, Joelle Bilski, bring forward for your consideration a proposed 2024-2025 uh, school calendar. Uh, in a moment, Ms. Bilski will summarize where we've been since we first came to you September 26th um, and offer a few options for your consideration. At the close of her summary, uh, we'll be available to answer any questions the board would have. Ms. Bilski. Thank you. As you know, at the September 26th Board of Education meeting, we presented a version of the 24-25 school calendar. <clears throat> During that meeting, a motion was made and proposed that we present some alternative um, calendars that had some considerations for half days. So two alternatives, versions two and three, were added for your consideration. This next slide predicts the three, or, I'm sorry, depicts the three versions of the calendar. I would like to point out in um, the version one, you'll notice that December 20th and May 16th are now asynchronous for teacher professional learning. The following slide relates specifically to version one and reflects attendance data that was gathered before, for the day before Thanksgiving and the day before winter break for the last two years, as well as information related to asynchronous learning um, days and grading and reporting days. At this time, we'd be happy to take any questions about any of the <coughs> versions that are presented. Questions from board members? Okay. Okay. So may I have a motion? Give me one sec. <coughs> so may I have a motion to approve version one as the 2024-2025 school calendar? So moved, Pumphrey. Second, Savoy. Thank you. Any discussion? I have some a question. Yes, go ahead. So I don't like version one. 
I I like version three <coughs> because it has more hours in it. Um, I'm still concerned with the half days in general across all of the calendars. And so when I look at the calendar for, like when we get to the end of the year, for instance, there are a lot of half days. Grading is closed and it's just half days. So this feels like it's com more so just compliance, checking the box to say, okay, we're, we're gonna meet the 180 day mark. When really, I mean, how many students are coming that if it's a half day after grades have closed? Have we looked at that attendance data? Um, I don't believe we've looked at the last days. We looked at the attendance data on the half days that we talked about before right. the holidays. Um, but the, la the half days at the end of the year, I know some of what happens there obviously is wrapping up end of the year things um, for students and you know teachers to get kids ready to be home for you know extended periods of time. Um, but we can certainly pull that data. Because I just I, I just don't want to waste people's time with the calendar. And when I think about the half days, especially at the end of the year, it just doesn't feel like it's, there's any substance there. Like the grades have closed. And so, and I just, okay, and I'm gonna go back to just thinking about the experience of some eighth grade students at that time, where it's like, just don't even send your kids to school, was told by a, a principal um, one year. And so I just, <laughs> Do we really need those half days at the end of the school year? When the grades close, can we end the, end the school year? We, so, did you want to? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. We absolutely have had this conversation about um, changing how we move forward with half days. Um, I, I will share with you that most recently we had a half day and some principals had posted how they use those days and they also posted um, uh, the percentage that I'm thinking about most recently was 93% attendance, but really shifting to uh, what was proposed by a member of this board before that we're using those activities that usually are disruptive during full days to be purposeful and intentional in planning. So whether it's students who need um, to, you know, make up some work because we're at the end of the quarter or other students, you know, participating in STEM activities, career days, et cetera. So we have started to make that shift. Now, let me put on the hat for the end of the school year half days um, all teachers I would argue every level need to need time um, in order to you know uh, tabulate those final grades for the students um, in high school in particular you might see a little bit in middle school but in high school in particular the students are taking exams almost up until those last days unless on the very last day you have a makeup day and so the afternoon the teachers don't leave the afternoon they are grading uh, all of those assessments and getting it into the grade book because as you know they only have one more day to come back and make sure that everything's taken care of in their rooms as well as the grades are turned in before they close out for the year. And so that has typically and historically in all systems been what the half days at the end of the year are used for. Um, you are right, typically in transition years where, you know, eighth grade that um, at, because they are done and they're ready to move into ninth grade, um, they might have less to do. That's definitely an area we could, you know, take a look at. I don't know if eighth graders would agree with us taking a look at that, uh, but but I think. Uh, these three versions that have been prevent, uh, presented by the staff, and uh, Ms. Hinn did ask that we uh, kind of walk through uh, all three of them. And so, uh, Ms. Bielski, if you don't mind uh, walking us through the uh, mental health uh, half days and, you know, what the half days al allow us to do in terms of ramping up our efforts around professional development uh, and what the differences are between version one, two, and three, I think that would be helpful for everyone. Sure. And if I just might add one, one thing before we walk through, um, the grades don't officially close until noon on June 14th so it's right up until that last time that makeup work is submitted and um, items are still left to be graded um, I just thought it was important to to point that out um, the um, first the first version of the calendar as you can see um, it 
it has December 20th and May 16th asynchronous so that students are learning asynchronously and, and teachers are able to um, plan and also have the half day for mental health. One of the things after the first presentation that we heard um, through email and I saw on many um, venues of social media was how valuable that time was for teachers, mm -hmm. that they needed that time to really regroup, they needed time to be able to recharge. Um, if you look at the second version, the last day of school is still the, the um, 16th, and we made some um, changes with the removal of those mental health half days, and again, did, did hear um, vocalized from teachers that how important it was and that they felt like um, it was a challenge for us to be taking that away from them. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third ver version of that extends the school year and you'll notice that we did put a full day in in light of the half day conversations um, for the 27th and the 16th. However, then that made us have to extend the school year in order to stay in compliance. Couldn't we just give the teachers a full day to do grading? And I, I, I know I brought that up before, but I just feel like when you have 100, you know, if you're an English language arts teacher with over 100 kids, essays to grade, you need a full day. And so could, is that a possibility that we could just give that full day to the teacher to, you know, close down their classrooms, do their uh, grading at the end of the year instead of trying to, you know, do both? So we have to be really, really careful with hours right. um, and, and working within the parameters of what is in front of us as far as the, the number of hours that are required and the number of days required. So that's one consideration. We also have to be really careful with inclement weather. Um, we, we, you know, we built in three, but who knows what that might look like as far as if we have a blizzard, for, for instance. So um, having those half days allows us more time in the hour um, consideration too and so when we look at the entire school year we really look at all of those things to make sure we aren't putting ourselves in a position where we would fall out of compliance and I, I'd also like to offer just as a former English teacher faced with all of those papers that I had two considerations one getting all of those papers graded and in the grade book but also particularly when we looked at seniors offering to be perfectly honest the maximum amount of time for students to be able to get work in, turn work in, come in, take exams, and to make sure that we had students who were able to graduate. That was of optimal importance. And so certainly if you're talking about at the secondary level, those days really do matter. Um, they really do matter in terms of working individually with students and making sure they have what they need. And so I just offer that. Um, it is certainly different on every level, but uh, that was a primary consideration. And I'll also add that even as a high school principal, I often sought the very last graduation day for the sole purpose of that gave me more time to get more kids what they needed so they could get across the stage and meet requirements. So there are a lot of considerations and nuances that go beyond what happens day to day in the classroom. And I just offer that just so there's full understanding of some of what happens on those days that may not be visible to people who aren't actually, you know, kind of in the trenches and doing the work. I totally thank you. Yeah. Um, Dr. Savoy, did you? I'm a former English teacher as well. Your microphone. A former English teacher and high school administrator as well. I totally agree with this calendar. And the professional development days are very much needed. There are five people up here who have been former teachers. So we do understand. And I agree with this calendar. I think it's great. Thank you. Ms. Frempong? Um, just a couple of questions, uh, points of clarification. So with calendar version number three, it says that the last day of school is Wednesday, June 18th, um, but June 16th is a half day. So June 17th and June 18th would be full days. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then uh, for all three of these versions, are these also still, um, are these pre-labor day or post-labor day? These are all pre-labor day. Pre-labor day, yes. okay, thank you. Other, Ms. Zaleski? Um, just something that I noticed. I don't, at this point, have a preference for one or the other, but thank you for putting them all together. Um, with schools ending on a Monday, I do believe it could be less likely that students would come, you know, with the goal of having kids be engaged, whereas with the third option, with it ending on Wednesday, it may make it more likely that attendance is better, 
for the Monday and Tuesday prior. Just an observation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Can you just walk us through the where the PD is? So I see for calendar one, we've got PD on the 20th and the 16th, correct? Yes. What about two and three? Um, so two and three have, did we not put them in? Um, are we losing holidays. it? It's the oh, it's the, the holidays. Those two half days. Okay, so the, okay. So we don't, there's not, there's more PD days than in version one. So we're lacking those two half days PDs in versions two and three. Correct. That's okay. Right. Yes. All right. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay. So we had stopped at discussion on option one. So we will then do a roll call vote for option one at this point. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempaul? Yes. Ms. Stileski? I'm going to say no just because I do really like the option for the Wednesday. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? No. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favor is nine. Favor is nine. So option one, version, calendar version one, then therefore passes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business consideration of board policies. This is the second reader for this policy, and for that I call on Ms. Christina Pumphrey, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend board policy 8131, administration and policy absence. This policy is presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit K. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policy 8131? So moved, from Pong. <laughs> Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I offer the following motion for the Board's consideration. I move to amend Policy 8131 by striking the second section and replacing it with the following. When immediate action must be taken to ensure continuity of teaching and learning, and when existing board policies do not address a given situation, the superintendent shall have the power to act and the responsibility to notify the board promptly of such action. The board chair, having conferred with the superintendent, may convene a special meeting for the board to discuss the situation and to provide timely guidance as necessary. The superintendent's action and recommendations regarding the need for policy shall be reviewed by the board at its next regularly scheduled public meeting. Thank you. Is there a second to Ms. Hen's motion? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Any discussion? Ms. Hen, would you like to speak to your motion? Sure. I'll be brief. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my motion clarifies the expectations when there is an emergency or urgent situation requiring the superintendent to act. Um, the board has seen such instances during the pandemic, for instance, following the ransomware attack, um, various situations where we learned what should have gone into policy. And this retains um, the intent of the policy and retains most of the content with a couple added points for clarification. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any questions or discussion? Ms. Pumphrey. Um, my initial reading of this, it was after thinking about it, I'm just um, a little concerned about the, the first change to the language, which is to ensure continuity of teaching and learning. Of course, that's a, the, our main goal. Um, I just don't want to limit us to anything specific uh, just based upon the fact that this is only for major emergency purposes. Um, so I'm a little bit concerned about that language, and I'm just curious to hear other board members' thoughts on that. Sure. Madam Chair, may I respond? Yes. Thank you. Um, so you're absolutely correct, um, Ms. Pumbrey, that the intent of this is to um, enable the superintendent with the authority to act in urgent priority situations. If we think about it, and I thought about this language quite a bit with and shared your concern, um, there, 
I couldn't think of a situation that would not have that have an impact on teaching and learning as a school system. Um, and if you think of that um, broadly or define that broadly, then that covers just about everything we do as our focus is on teaching and learning. So I I understand your concern. It's in, I included that to emphasize that these are four important decisions that need to be made. But of course, it would be the superintendent's judgment, which we trust. Thank you, Ms. Frempong. Um, this is one of the policies that came through PRC. And um, as a member of the PRC committee, one of the questions I had in trying to understand this, I had asked um, Ms. Howie about had we ever had an instance of this happen before. Is Ms. Howie still here? She's a high. And so um, in asking that question, if I remember correctly, um, Ms. Howie was saying we had not. Is that correct when we discussed this? Good evening, board members. So yes, Ms. Frempong, that's correct. During PRC, uh, when this was presented, uh, I did research going back 14 years and was not able to find when this particular policy had been used. Thank you. I just wanted to have that clarification for everyone as well. So um, again, coming through the PRC committee, we were, um, I guess, content or satisfied with the wording as it was. Thank you. Thank you. There were some hands over here. Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am a little unclear as to uh, the section in the proposed amendment which says the board chair, having conferred with the superintendent, may convene a special meeting for the board to discuss the situation and to provide timely guidance as necessary. Is this is the intent of this post or pre decision making. May I respond, Madam mm -hmm. Chair? Thank you. And thank you for the question, Ms. Harvey. Um, it is at the discretion of the superintendent. So of course, um, this enables her to act without this conference, but this enable, this provides an option. Should she wish to um, seek guidance from the board and should time allow, then after conferring with the chair, it would be up to the two of them to um, convene a special meeting if necessary. So it allows flexibility both ways, either pre or post, depending on the situation. And if I may also respond to Ms. Howie's comment, Madam Chair, um, the two situations that I mentioned when um, Dr. Williams was um, faced with making these decisions, absent board discussion or policy, were those two situations. Um, COVID-19 situation. Again, there were no policies um, for a global pandemic and as well as the ransomware um, incident. Many decisions had to be made um, that were time sensitive and this policy enabled him to act and make those decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments on Ms. Hen's amended motion or motion? Okay, then we need a roll call vote on the amended policy wording. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? No. Ms. Frempong? No. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? No. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? No. Ms. Lichter? No. Favor is seven. So the amended motion passes, correct? Yes. So we do not vote on the original one. Okay. We're voting as amended. Okay. So now we're voting on the policy as amended. <coughs> Any, um, so roll call vote, please. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? No. Ms. Frempong? No. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? No. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? No. Ms. Lichter? No. Beaver is seven. So the amended motion passes. Amended policy passes. Okay, thank you. 
The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. For that, I call on Ms. Devasti Jones. Good evening, board members, um, Madam Chair, Dr. Rogers. For the record, I'm Claude Devasti Jones. Um, earlier this evening, the board met in closed session in its quasi judicial capacity to render a decision in case HE 2404. Now would be an appropriate time to confirm the action taken in closed session. Thank you. May I have a motion to affirm the action taken during closed session on hearing examiner case HE 24 04? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second from Paul. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Tominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? No. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> no Ms. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call on Ms. Harvey, <laughs> Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank our committee vice chair, Mr. Young, for leading yesterday's contract meeting on very short notice. <laughs> it is reassuring to know that when life happens, my colleagues uh, are there. So thank you very much, Mr. Young. Members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee met on Monday, November 6, 2023. Items M1 through M9 and items M11 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Items M10 uh, will be pulled out separately. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve items M1 through M9 and M11? So moved. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion mm -hmm. on M1 and M11? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Tominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stoleski? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve item M10? So moved from Paul. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion on M10? Point of order, Madam Chair. We do need a second since the committee did not make a recommendation on M10. Okay, thank you. May I have a second on M10? Pumphrey. Thank you, Ms. Pumphrey. Any discussion on M10? Mr. McMillian. We posed a couple questions that we, that we were hoping to get answers for. Okay. Sure. Uh, the, the, uh, the questions that came up last night was, uh, uh, one, are schools uh, required to use security vendors approved under this contract or can they pay SROs to provide after hours security? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, you can use SROs as well as the contracts. That was one question. You're still, you can still use SROs if you choose. So to question that, so if the, the, the principal has mon money in his budget for security, yes. so rather than use one of those contractors, he can, now how do they negotiate that? Is there already agreement with the police department on whether they get time and a half or whether they adjust those hours? That part, I know, uh, yes, Dr. Because back in the day, sometimes the SRO came in later in the day and covered an athletic event. So they weren't real keen on that sometimes, but. Good evening, moments, members of the board. Um, you're correct, and in order to do that, the SRO often was not available during the school day for coverage. Um, the difference here is that we have received a grant that will allow us to pay the school resource officers in addition to the funds that schools receive for hiring their security vendors. And so our goal is to have several layers of security. So the school from their budget, will provide for the security vendors this contract. And then through the grant we received, we can then fund um, SROs or other officers. 
So if the SROs that are assigned to the school are interested, then they could be paid from a separate grant? Correct. Correct. It is preferred that we use our SROs. If the SROs are not available, then we can move on to other officers. Okay. And then that wasn't my question. I posed another question. Do you have that? <laughs> right. Can you um, repeat that question just so we make sure we have that? Right? Was that your question, Ms. Han? The you, one? you asked it beautifully, Mr. McMillian, so I'm good. Thank you. Okay. I posed a question about school safety assistance. Could they be paid out of this contract? They cannot, and this contract requires specific training and insurance that is provided by those vendors who oversee the security officers that they send to us. Many of them are off-duty police officers or retired military. They also have to have training in carrying weapons because they are armed security. Okay, so the SR, or excuse me, the school safety assistants are not an option when it comes to dances or athletic contests or things not like that? Not through this funding with this contract. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about M10? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempaw? Yes. Ms. Jalewski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on the budget training for the student member of the board. And for that, I call Mr. Hartlove. Sure. Um, and let me get, make sure I have that in front of me. I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. So, um, the annotated, annotated uh, code of Maryland section 3-2B-05E um, required us to develop budget training for the student member of the board, Ms. Drummond. Student members must complete the budget training after being elected to uh, after being elected to vote on fiscal matters. We did bring the training to um, the budget. Not, uh, to the board's budget committee on October 18th, 2023. Got some good feedback from the budget committee on um, on adding things such as uh, definitions, maybe putting in some, uh, not tests, but kind of understanding uh, breaks. Text for understanding. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, so we are uh, we are going to add those those items. But we the big thing is is tomorrow we are going to work uh, with Miss Drummond to schedule her training. Okay, thank you. And the training is the PowerPoint that's been put on board docs. The training is the is the PowerPoint, and you know this is uh, a little bit of a guinea pig. We're, we're going to step you through this. You'll get uh, you'll get in-person training. Oh, it, we could do it via uh, Teams or anything like that. But I mean, it'll, you'll be you'll have a, someone to actually that can answer live questions as you go through. Uh, but we'll we'll develop this over. Uh, we'll get your feedback, and we'll develop it uh, and uh, refine it as uh, over the years. Right, and it's also good for. Just us other board members, too, to take a look at. We talked about that as far as maybe a new board member orientation, uh, having something like this, depending on the time uh, frame, the time that we have, yes. Thank you. Any um, questions, Ms. Sen? Just a comment, Madam Chair. Thank you. I would second what um, Ms. Lichter said. This would have been so helpful when I came on the board the first time and, and all new board members and really outstanding job putting this together. I missed the budget committee presentation, but I went through every slide of it and it's truly incredible work. So this, thank you. And, and you're welcome. Involved. This is a, a was a team effort between the budget folks and the facilities folks because there's a capital section in here. So Mr. Dick, Dixit worked on part of this and Mr. Witt, Mr. Witt, Mr. Uh, Tantliff and his staff also worked on this. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Booker Dwyer. And I just want to commend you because I saw the, the first iteration of this and I see the second one and it and I see the improvement. So um, so thank you for that. It, it is much stronger. And I do think um, all board members can benefit from this. Thank you. Other questions or comments? OK, thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on elementary literacy. And for that, I call on Dr. DiDonato, Dr. Jones, Ms. Shea, and Dr. 
Okay, maybe not Miss Jones. She, <laughs> she's giving me that look back there. And Dr. Kraft. <laughs> I'm just reading my script. It had her name in there. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Okay, Dr. Rogers will begin. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, can we put up the slides, please? Bless you. Thank you. It's a very polite group tonight. <laughs> Next slide, please. We are very pleased this evening to provide an update on elementary literacy, uh, what steps we're taking as uh, members of Team BCPS to improve the uh, academic um, achievement of our students around literacy. On this slide in front of you, you see our four identified academic uh, priorities. But right next to that, uh, in a moment, we're going to show you a short clip of a teacher, uh, Ms. Cheney, who is a teacher at Newtown Elementary School. We have had the opportunity to visit many schools, all levels, and observe teaching and learning that started very early the school year we were most impressed when we walked into Miss Cheney's classroom and not only uh, her level of uh, preparedness for her students and her holding every single student in her class to high expectation but the student responses and so what you see here is what we want for all of our students in all of our elementary schools as we move forward throughout this year and so with that if you can play the clip please What was the genre that we started yesterday? Hey, Luma, you got him? Realistic fiction. I love that. Now, we said realistic fiction has a few things. Does anybody remember it? Now, second grade, I took your note paper yesterday. Remember, Ms. Ms. Cheney collected it, Nyla took it. What are some things that a realistic fiction story is going to have? We highlighted some words. Who has a good memory? Sebastian, give me one thing. Yeah. Characters. We're going to have some characters in a story. What else are we going to have? Nyla. Events. Events. The details that happen in the story. There was something else. Where am I? Where am I? Jawan? Setting. The setting. Excellent. And we said a realistic fiction is our events that could really happen in real life. We're not aliens. We're not in outer space. There are some events that could really happen in real life. Not the same like Clark the Shark, because we know that was a what kind of story? Who can make a, make a difference between the genres? Clark the Shark was what type of story? A.Y.? It was a fantasy, because it was all made up. It was kind of silly to start the year, but now we're getting into some realistic fiction. Thank you. And uh, that clip does not begin to uh, really showcase the level of excitement and the rigor that was in that classroom. And so in a moment, we're going to have both um, uh, Ms. Shea. What's the genre that we started <laughs> yesterday? It's that repeat. What's the genre? You should all know the answer now. Uh, both uh, Ms. Shea and Dr. Kraft really walk us through uh, the changes that we've made and what our comprehensive literacy program in elementary schools looks like. Um, next slide, please. We certainly want to thank uh, Ms. Cheney as well as Principal Croston at Newtown Elementary School for letting us uh, visit uh, the school. Uh, on this slide really helps us to center around what we're looking for with our students. Um, again, we thank the Board of Education for your considerable investment in moving us forward with a new literacy program for our elementary school students. Our goal is to make sure that this literacy program, which if you look at the uh, graphic that's in front of you, it's our tier one. It's what all of our students are going to experience, uh, both in whole group and small small group instruction, and it's our goal that it's so successful that we have um, a smaller percentage of students, somewhere in um, no more than 20 percent, but 15 to 20 percent of our students that need additional supports, um, additional supports being tier two instruction, which really speaks to the explicit and uh, more explicit and systematic instruction for our students where we're teaching, reviewing, and practicing in targeted areas, and then a much smaller percentage of our our students needing tier three. And so we're excited that we have a new curriculum that is directly aligned to our state standards and uh, 
these two uh, staff members will really talk you through um, not only what's in HMH into reading, but what else we're offering to our students, because there is no one product that is going to meet the needs of every single student in every single school. And so with that, I turn it over to you guys. All right, next slide, please. So I know this is a graphic we have used often. I'm not gonna talk through it at length, but again, just to visually remind us of the different strands that are necessary for skilled reading. And so as we look at that top strand uh, that uh, illustrates language comprehension, that is really what our HMH into reading is targeting, is working on that comprehension piece. And you can see under the comprehension piece how many different pieces are are involved to becoming a skilled reader, a strategic reader. On the bottom part of the rope, you can see uh, that is our word recognition strand. And for that part, we are still using our foundational skill, open court, to teach those skills explicitly. And so when both of those pieces come together, then we will see increasingly strategic and increasingly fluent and automatic readers um, that become skillful readers. And so we're looking at both and the necessity of both of those to really move our readers forward and change what our current uh, level is when we start to look at the different tiers of instruction. <coughs> Next slide. So when we start talking about the universal screeners in BCPS, and if you'll click two more times, uh, there's some guidance that MSDE gives to us around what those screeners should look like in terms of assessing our students. Again, as, an, a, as a benchmark screener to know universally how our students are doing. And so they give us some very specific guidelines and they provide a list of approved screeners. Additionally, if you'll click one more time, it tells us that you are supposed to screen students within the first two months of the beginning of the school year. And so that is uh, what we have done. All of our uh, screening took place by October 13th, and we are going to actually share the results that we have um, for actually the two screeners that we are using currently in BCPS. Will you click um, again? Um, so we have uh, Dibbles 8 um, and we also have Amira and so we are using both of those screeners. Both, both of those screeners are approved by MSDE and uh, we will look at how our students did on that universal screening. So for Dibbles you can see we have, um, we have several schools that are still using Dibbles um, and for those about 17 schools, this is the um, aggregate data by grade level. And so as we know, anyone that is scoring in that red range are students that we are going to want to get additional information on because right now what that screener is indicating is that they're at risk for not meeting grade level proficiency in reading by the end of the year. Um, and so this is uh, just a reflection of where we are at this moment in the fall. Um, based based on the Dibble screening data. On the next slide, we're gonna show you our Amira fall data. And so you can see it again broken down by grade. Um, again, the students um, in red are our students that have been flagged for being at risk. And yellow are students that we wanna find out some more information on. Green, um, and of course in Dibbles, the green and blue in Dibbles indicate that they are at core instruction are, are not likely to need additional supplemental instruction to be successful. And so when we talk a little bit about um, the different types of assessments we use, so when we do Amir and Dibbles and our students come up in that red or at risk category, then we need to get more information. And so the screener is really just a quick measure to determine if there are students that might be in, a, in need of more assistance. The diagnostic assessment is going to help teachers in making decisions about what instruction that students might need and what are the exact areas of need that are showing up. 
After that point, we are continually progress monitoring through uh, both formative and summative assessments to determine if students are making improvements and to really determine the effectiveness of the instruction for the student. And so those three types of assessments work together to give us a complete picture and to ensure that students are not slipping through the cracks and that we are surfacing students that need additional support. Next slide. So uh, for Amira, and I know we've talked about Dibble's reports a lot, so we just wanted to show you that Amira does provide a plethora of different ways to analyze data for the teacher. And so the teacher can really look at a variety of different reports to know how to plan whole group instruction, how to plan small group instruction, and really how to plan for individual student needs. And so if they're looking at the whole group instruction, they're gonna look at that class progress report. Um, if they wanna plan for responsive literacy instruction, they're gonna look at that skills status report and if they really want to drill down to individual readers and know how do I support this specific reader uh, there's a couple of reports that will give them very specific information um, and those include the skills diagnostic report the progress report and the instructional recommendations report we have done this training with our principals and our reading specialist uh, so that they know how to use these reports how to level leverage them in PLC and planning time. And also, uh, we have one quick one minute videos for each type of report so that classroom teachers can look and say, okay, what does this report do and how do I use it to make instructional decisions? Next slide. So I have the pleasure of updating you on our professional learning. So I was, I'm so grateful for the conversation around the calendar because the board has been so supportive about knowing that purchasing the curriculum is just step one. It's really about the professional learning and making sure that every level of the organization, our teachers, our teacher leaders, and our administrators um, have that support. So we have moved beyond training into coaching for instruction. So I'm still gonna talk to you about updates for training, but training is really just about what is it? How is this curriculum organized? How do I navigate it? Now we are moving into coaching for instruction. And what that looks like is that every school is going to have a school-based coaching visit. We've already conducted 15 school visits to date, and we have about another 16 scheduled just for this week. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more in a future slide about what those coaching visits look like. But the point I want to illustrate is we're now taking it to the schools. And they're going to have that job embedded opportunity to have coaching for instruction that goes beyond just training. We also have a teacher leader core. This is a really exciting initiative where we are building teacher leadership opportunities for teachers who are in the classroom, practitioners using this curriculum to also develop the leadership so that we have a team of leaders right in the building that can support their colleagues. This is also an important part of Blueprint. Blueprint talks about school districts having to build pathways for teachers to develop leadership experiences without having to leave the classroom so that we can have teachers like the one we just saw be a leader right from her classroom and be able to, to do both. Our teacher leader core, I'll also explain a little bit more about what we've done to date, uh, but this is an exciting opportunity to build capacity of our teachers to lead for instruction using this new exciting curricular resource. Um, Amira Champion, so uh, Dr. Kraft mentioned that Amira is one component and that has two parts, and thank you Chair Lichter for sharing your experience not only is it used as a screener, but it's used as a practice. And so each school has the opportunity to identify one, or in some cases more than one, Amira champion, which is someone who has an interest in being a leader around Amira. So best practices for how to engage learners, supporting teachers with navigating some of those reports, and uh, connecting with users all across really the country around how to best use Amira to support their students. Um, and then we do as a district have virtual coaching licenses. And what that means is point of use, immediate support right from the publisher and from the authors of this curriculum. This is an exciting way, again, to spread the wealth. So we don't, we certainly, as an office, um, work to be very responsive to questions that come up. When you're adopting something this significant that is so critical to the priority area in our system, we also wanna make sure that schools have real-time support. And so the way we've been using these virtual coaching licenses is again to build that leadership at the school level through our reading specialists or in some cases administrators so that they have that real time access to virtual coaching. 
We are still, though, on the right-hand side, working on those monthly touch points around implementation. Because while I've said we've moved into professional learning, we're not finished. We still know that we are working to make sure that we have integrity of implementation, that we are really utilizing the curriculum the way the evidence-based evidence research supports and that we're supporting our teachers and our teacher leaders. And so every month, this is a standing item for principal leadership development. To date, as Dr. Kraft said, last month we talked about data literacy support and helping them to navigate that AMIRA screening and then today, we were at Principal Leadership Development, and actually today our principals got a twofer because we had our ELA um, session was around data around the comprehension assessments and the modules, and then we did a crossover episode where when they came for the ESOL session, the ESOL session was about how to leverage resources from the HMH curriculum to support our multilingual learners. And this was designed to help our principals leverage the resources to support two of our system priority areas, both with ELA and with supporting multilingual learners. We have monthly um, professional learning for our reading specialists, where we tap into their knowledge base and expertise around coaching teachers. And then we also partner with our staff development teachers so that there is another resource in the building uh, with that implementation. So we wanted to illustrate that we have moved into coaching for instruction, but we continue to have those regular touch points at multiple levels of the organization to support that. Next slide. But as I mentioned, we do also continue to train because we know our district, we continue to onboard new teachers. We have teachers that did not participate in the summer, perhaps because they were late hires. Uh, we have trained, at this point it's over 4,000 teachers, just in the actual initial training too. Um, and so we want to make sure that um, teachers also on the right hand side, you can see uh, there are teacher success pathways built into the curriculum itself. So we have the initial training that is two parts that we've done with over close to 4,000 teachers. But we also have teacher success pathways built into the resources again for point of view. So teachers can access this at any time. Next slide. <coughs> So I mentioned the on-site coaching visits. So this is, um, again, part of our effort to make sure we're shifting into implementation. So an HMH coach visits each elementary school to provide job embedded coaching. You can see here the menu of what might be included in that visit, but what's critically important is that the principal has an opportunity to direct what that work looks like to make sure that we're meeting the diverse needs of our schools. So you can imagine the needs of a school that has a lot of new educators might be different than a school that has um, some more seasoned experience. Um, in some cases, these coaches facilitate grade level planning. In others, they're going into classrooms and providing that coaching support in classroom, supporting data and analysis, and even helping them if they've identified a specific component. So a school might say, we're doing really well with the shared reading, but we need help with writing. Or we want to talk specifically about how to support um, responsive instruction. Or they might identify, again, as we illustrated today, how to support a particular group of students, so multilingual learners, or perhaps students receiving special education, or students in need of acceleration and enrichment. Um, the important piece is that the principal and their leadership team with that reading specialist gets to design that and they get that um, job embedded support right within their school with their students and their teachers. Next slide. <laughs> so I mentioned our teacher leader core. Um, again, we're really excited about these potential pathways for developing capacity of teacher leaders. Here, <coughs> excuse me, here's some of what we've done to date with our teacher leader course. So again, digging deeper into that curriculum to help them learn how to support effective planning, but also to help them understand the why behind the decision making. Teachers make a thousand decisions every day based on what they know about their students. And so while we've provided them with this incredible resource, they still need to make decisions based on the needs of their students. And so part of what we do with our teacher leader core is to build that capacity for teachers to make that instru instructional decision knowing what they know about their kids, but also locating those curricular supports, whether in HMH or in Schoology. We've also leveraged our teacher leader court, that's okay, you can go to the next one, to help us with provide feedback. So we're committed to ongoing feedback for teachers and teacher leaders as we work to implement them, uh, these resources, so that we can provide and adjust our support. So I know this board loves data, as does our superintendent. So we had 99 out of 112 elementary schools represented at this teacher leader core. And I put an asterisk there because the 13 schools that couldn't attend 
all reached out to us and said, we just couldn't let the teachers leave. We may have had a challenge finding substitutes. So we are offering after school workshops. And so we believe we're going to get to 100% of schools that have that opportunity for a teacher leader core. Uh, we had 427 teachers. So in many cases, we had multiple teachers come. We invite them to send representatives from every grade level, but we ask them to consider trying to send at least one primary and one intermediate since the resources are different. <laughs> We had 68 schools send us at least four participants uh, truly committed to building that capacity for leadership within. Um, so I'm sure you can hear how excited we are about <laughs> building that capacity for professional learning. I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Kraft on the next slide um, to share a little bit more about professional learning. Uh, so in addition to the professional learning that we've been doing around into reading, we continue to do around open court. Uh, we also have um, really um, started our deep professional learning around the science of reading. And so when we're talking about the science of reading, we're really talking about the five decades of research that has gone into um, looking at what the evidence says around how students learn to read. Um, and this is through multiple fields of study, so it's not owned by education by itself, um, but very um, interdisciplinary work. Um, because we do know that there is a way that the brain acquires reading and that there are methods that we can use that will be more successful for students. And so one of the things that we always like to say is that sometimes we reduce the science of reading to phonics, but really the science of reading is around <coughs> phonemic awareness, it's around phonics, it's around fluency, it's around vocabulary, and it's around comprehension, and really understanding what are those principles that we are going to use that will lead to effective acquisition of reading. Um, next slide. And so really as we start to think about, um, on the left-hand side, you can see, again, that interdisciplinary nature of the research is coming from so many different fields, from linguistics to neuroscience to education to psychology to inform our instruction. And then we really want to emphasize that the science of reading is not a fad. It's not a buzzword. It's not going away. It's not just one program of instruction. It's not synonymous. You know, some publishers like to be like, this is a science of reading product. Science of reading is a set of principles and instructional methodology that can be incorporated through a variety of different programs. And so that's why it's so important for us to understand what the science of reading is so that when we do look at programs and curriculum that we can say, oh yes, they are aligned to the science of reading. As part of this effort, we are looking to train 100% of our K-3 to teachers. That's our kind of our first uh, wave. If you go to the next slide. Um, so that we can ensure that all teachers know um, not only the theory behind the science of reading, but what is the practice that it takes. And so we have been working not only in our K to three educators, but also administrators. And so as part of that, uh, we know that sometimes the science of reading can be very theoretical based in nature. And so we have started these community of practices um, that are aligned to our letters, professional learning, to really help people say, okay, so if this is what I learned in unit one, then what would that look like in the classroom? Whether I'm a teacher or I'm a teacher leader or I'm an administrator. And so at our first, um, uh, community of practice, so it's very new. Uh, we had five schools represented, um, but so many people have expressed interest that we actually have to find a new location for our second one um, for unit two. And so we're really excited because this was really a voluntary opportunity to say, what would this look like in practice? And so really what some of the feedback that we got from the participants was, it is great to be able to talk to my colleagues across multiple schools. It's great to learn about what I should be seen in instruction. It's great to know what are those decisions that I'm making in the moment. And so that's really what we're trying to foster in those community of practice, is to provide a safe space to say, well, this is what I learned, but I don't really know what that means when I go and do it in the classroom. And so that is another level of support that we're providing in addition to the macro training we're providing. Uh, next slide.
And so we realize, though, that the only way that we get better is to continue to get feedback. And so we really do have a continuous improvement cycle. And so you heard Ms. Shea a few minutes ago talk about at the end of every teacher <coughs> leader core, we actually have structured feedback sessions where they can give us feedback about what is working, what's not working, what additional support is needed. We then take all of that feedback and we go through and look for those patterns and trends across time what are we seeing we also have it by grade level so we can start to see are these across grade levels are they specific to a grade level so for example in kindergarten we've heard a lot about i need additional support in the writing process i need to know what i need to do with my students and so that's something that we then would then plan our professional learning specific to kindergarten. There's other things that people are saying we need in every single grade and that will inform our professional learning. We will continue to do learning walks, again, not associated to a teacher, but to a grade level to inform the professional learning experiences that we need. And we've been very excited that we've been invited with several executive directors to walk in the buildings with them and to talk about, okay, how does this um, align to the into reading program tell me more about this component and so we've really been walking shoulder to shoulder with the executive directors as we're looking at the implementation in the building all of this has provided very rich information about what we need to do um, what we need to continue to do as well as maybe things that we can drop off at this point because they're now at a sustainability point point. and so uh, at this point we can uh, take any questions questions um Ms. Pumphrey. Hi. Um, so I have a specific question about the, um, or a couple questions about the on-site coaching visits. Yes. Um, you mentioned that they were school specific, so based on a school's needs, which is wonderful. Yes. Um, what type of feedback have you gotten from that? And also you mentioned that it was 15 schools so far that have had visits. Um, when do you anticipate that the remainder of the schools will have on-site visits? Great question. So I'm going to answer the second one first, which is that our goal is actually that every school will have a visit in the first semester, so by the end of January, because then they'll all get a second visit with the same coach in the second semester, mm -hmm. so that we hope it's not a drive-by, <clears throat> but rather that cycle of opportunity. So our goal is to have all of our schools have their first coaching visit by the end of the second marking period or first semester. Um, the feedback actually today, uh, several of the principals that have had their visit uh, grabbed me in the hallway to say, you know, this was wonderful, I loved it, I already know what I want to do for the next visit. We also invited some of our principal colleagues. Part of what we do at our principal leadership development is let them talk to each other because they don't get as many opportunities. Um, so Dr. Kraft can certainly chime in, but um, we're getting a lot of feedback of they really like having it in their building. That's really huge and we don't always do that. Sometimes a district of our size, we leverage train the trainer or we leverage other models and so they really have appreciated um, being in that driver's seat the one hesitation some principals have shared is it's so new to them they don't know yet what they don't know or need so some of the feedback we've gotten is after the visit they have a more idea about what they want for the the second visit so we have implemented um, almost like a coaching support call before the visit where we offer some drop-in coaching hours the principals can come pick our brains about well what would you do Megan or Jen with this visit um, to try to support them in planning because sometimes that's the one piece of feedback they say is I don't know yet I want all of it um, can you help me prioritize do you have anything you want to add yeah, so one comment that particularly sticks out, and it was great, they organically said if they'd had the coaching visits, and so one of the principals said it was a game changer, was the exact uh, phrase that they used. Um, and so uh, in addition to those um, coaching sessions that we're offering to say, like, how do you want to develop your schedule, as we have found some good schedules that have been submitted because they submitted ahead of time, we continue to um, send them out to principals to say, oh, here's another way a, a school set up their coaching visit. And so um, we're very excited. Um, January is the latest. We're trying to get all the visits through uh, before winter break, but um, but definitely before the end of semester one. That same coach, like Ms. Shea said, will come back. But in between, they're also giving their contact information so they have a person that they know that they can reach out to for support. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Mr. Young? Are the HMH coaches BCPS employees trained? So they're HMH they employees? They are HMH. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Other questions? Ms. Harvey? 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a, a couple of questions about Amira and Dibbles. You talked. To, you said that 17 schools are still using Dibbles. Is that by preference, by? Yes. Okay. So we, um, because of the time at which we adopted HMH, as you all know, was late in the school year. And because Dibbles is um, something that many of our teachers had invested a significant time in training, we did for this year offer schools the choice. So we knew every student would have a mirror practice. We knew that the law required they had to use a screener, but we did give schools the option to choose to stay with Dibbles for their screener this year. Um, and we had, I think it might be 19, 19, 19 schools 19, yeah. that opted to stay um, with Dibbles. I also want to clarify too, all of our schools still have access to Dibbles. And so when there is a student for whom Amira, whether there's any question or the teachers or schools think, I'm not sure that this is the, the best fit for mm -hmm. a screener for this student, they can use the Dibbles screener for an individual individual student that they might have questions about. So it hasn't been eliminated from anyone else. It was just the choice they made about the universal screener. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then my second question is, you talked about the levels of support and communication uh, in interpreting the anal and analyzing the results of AMIRA for teachers, including a report and a video and those kinds of things. How is that getting translated to parents? Great question. Do you want to talk about the parent report? Yeah, so there is a parent report uh, that uh, can be sent out to the parents where it will tell exactly where the student is and it actually gives some recommendations for things that parents can do at home and so those should be uh, going home. I actually had a school uh, reach out recently um, and said, oh, you know, during American Education Week, we're actually going to um, do a little preview of how they would read the parent report. And so schools are doing some different things to help uh, parents understand since we've been using Dibbles for so long and so parents are familiar with that to really help them understand okay well what does this look like because it's different than what we were seeing with Dibbles before. And, and the report is system generated and is it in plain language we tend to use a lot of technical language that doesn't necessarily help parents pinpoint exactly where their children are in a process so does the report require interpretation by a second party or can the parents? It, it's a great question because educators we love, there's no acronyms and, and educator jargon. It really talks about, um, it gives specific parent friendly suggestions of what um, parents can do. Where I think there is some interpretive and where we've been supporting teachers is around what is the uh, Amira Reading Mastery or ARM? What does this number mean? Um, and that's where we've provided guidance with teachers and there's actually a resource that goes with it that we've um, shared with reading specialists to help them navigate that. So that's a little bit, um, I would say the suggestions for parents are pretty um, clear and explicit for parents, uh, but it is a new system. And so understanding the numbers and what that score means is really where we've been leaning in with teachers about providing that support. Um, we also heard from some teachers that plan at, um, and I was so glad to hear us advertising elementary conference day is huge. Um, teachers can actually let parents listen to the recording of their child during the conference day and actually walk them through that data as a part of the conference, which is really more beneficial than any piece of paper I can send home is to actually engage. So we've been really trying to lean in on that elementary conference day um, and support teachers with that. Anything you would add? Uh, no, but those <coughs> colors are actually reflected. So when we showed you the red, yellow, and green, that's actually reflected on the graph that goes home. And if they are using it as a screener and practice, they'll actually have any data that is reflective of the screener and or practice um, that will show a goal line of where we would expect the student to be um, by the end of the year. So it does give some good information. And then we have an annotated report that schools can use that, you know, that's a fake student, no names have been involved with it, um, that they could help walk them through. Thank you. Yeah. Um, to follow up on what Ms. Harvey said with the Dibbles versus Amira, is it um, the intent that next year to all of our um, elementary schools are using Amira or will it still be a choice or not decided yet? So we haven't decided yet. And part of that is because we're trying to be authentic to the feedback process. So for example, um, <coughs> kindergarten teachers. Kindergarten teachers are very passionate that kindergarten is different, and it is. And so we may get to a point where there's one recommendation by grade level um, 
it would be um, great to have one <laughs> screener, but we are open to the actual process of um, folks giving us feedback about Amira, both grade specific. This is our first time now sharing the information with parents, and so we, we want to be open to that this year. Um, obviously, there's going to be a screener no matter what, because that's part of our obligation, um, but we are really open to making that decision later in the year. So when I look at the Dibbles versus the Amira results, there's some like discrepancies as far as like K, um, yep. the K, the red versus, you know, is different. Um, the red for the other grades seems pretty consistent, um, but the Dibbles showing us the green and the blue is, is, is different than what Amira is showing. Now I know the numbers of kids for Dibbles is far less than the number of kids that took it for um, so, Amira, are there any beginning thoughts about why there's the discrepancy between the two screeners? <laughs> so it's a great question. It's something we've also been talking about. Um, so first, one of the things we have to put in the space with Dibbles is it is human administered and human scored. And so we do often lean in on inner rate of reliability. And so this is literally a human sitting in a one minute timed marking up text for students, which is challenging. And because it's our fall benchmark, sometimes some of the discrepancy may be about training and about that inner rate of reliability. Um, but we also recognize on the flip side with Amira, it's a new technology and, and students and teachers are learning on how that works. So we don't want to over um, decide what it means yet, but it is something that we're looking at. We also talked about making sure we're comparing apples to apples because the 19 schools we did not, this is not a controlled study, mm -hmm. right? So we did not choose 19 mm -hmm. schools that are commensurate with another 19 schools. This was principals, where are you with your staff? So we may not be comparing schools that have commensurate populations of readers that they serve to begin with. Um, we're curious, so we're asking some of those same questions and it's a part of the ongoing conversation. The critical piece too to remember is this is a screener. Right. This is not any data point that's used to determine one thing in isolation. It is just that. It's a screener, and the language that we're really specific about is who is at risk for potential reading failure. It is not a sole data point to make any decisions about a student's educational placement. It is just that. It's the warning light coming on in your car and you pulling it into the mechanic and saying what's going on. That, that's really what we're talking about. So we're asking some of the same questions. We're noticing some of the same patterns. It's also important to note Dibbles has four different um, cut scores where Amira has three. So we're trying to look at some of that crosswalking as well. So if it's just a screener, then diagnostic testing would happen for the kids who are in red or red on both of them. What, what you may have said it, but I missed it. What diagnostic, what does that look like, the diagnostic level? You sure? I can read. <laughs> Uh, so um, the the other thing I just to close out the other question before I talk about the uh, diagnostic is um, so I happened to be in a school the other day that had um, selected Amira and so the teacher was just chatting with me I was asking her how she liked it how the kids liked it and she was like I can tell you I used to grade dibbles wrong all the time because it went by so quick and it was just you know one of those moments where like you know she was just saying anecdotally she was like but now I can listen back to what they say you know she was like it's just a a very different ball game for me. Um, for diagnostic testing, we have them do the beginning and advanced decoding survey, which will give us a, a sense of where some of the breakdown might be occurring. Um, if a student, based on that diagnostic, so the screener might have flagged something, and when we go to check in more, like, nope, everything's good. But if things are sh popping up, we will see that in the diagnostic, and it will also tell us, well, what is it that we need to support this student with? Um, and help us make decisions about what level of support we want to put in place for that student. And the diagnostic is one to one with the teacher. That's correct. And okay. the diagnostic is consistent for both screeners. So that is used whether you were screened with Dibbles or Amira. That's correct. Thank you. I could ask a thousand more, but I'm going to stop. <laughs> Ms. Hen. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Hi. Kraft, Ms. Shea. Thank you for this presentation, first of all. Um, it's outstanding. And Ms. Shea, I especially appreciate your um, explanation of the choice of screeners, that that is still a choice for teachers. Mm -hmm. um, some may not be aware of that, so that might be a communication opportunity. Yeah. Um, a few teachers have reported that one thing that um, Dibbles excels in is with students that have accents or um, we, we get that question a lot. So it's helpful <laughs> to hear that they have the option to use Dibbles. Yep. Um, 
given that a mirror is computer based and Absolutely. and doesn't have that human factor to yep. allow for differentiation so that would be one reason as you're making that decision to um, consider continuing to allow that choice sure and part of what exactly what we talked about uh, twofold um, we've heard that about students with speech impediments and wondering about whether or not it's really accurate uh, but we've also heard human beings say they don't know if they're accurate in scoring that both ways. So sometimes even having multiple data points um, for exactly that purpose. So I appreciate the opportunity to say loud and on camera, yes, if you've done a mirror and you have any question about whether um, students who have an accent, now the research body from a mirror, they have tested it with students with accents, but teachers know if they feel that it was reflective of their student or not. And so our recommendation is then use dipples. Let's have another data point so that we really have that opportunity for that student. Um, we've also talked about some of our speech pathologists listening in to the Amira recording if it's a student with a speech impediment and then making a decision. If they're going right to a diagnostic, it might not be necessary to repeat the screener because they'll get that one on one human delivered interaction with the diagnostic mm -hmm. um, to help address any of those outstanding questions. Thank you, sure. which brings um, us to my second question. <laughs> On slide three, there's a graphic that's very clear and helpful. It presents the three tiers of instruction. Uh, are these targeted numbers? And I, I noticed by the footnote, it's not our graphic, but rather um, based on the research. And in, in comparing it to our Dibbles and Amira data, the two don't align. So I'd imagine this might be, these might be targets for us. Yes. Based on what Dr. Rogers so that has is what the shared. research says. Those numbers are exactly what you just described. That's the goal. Um, we've shown this as a pyramid in the past. We've shown this lots of different ways. That's the goal. Um, it's not our current state. So, um, and it's not something that we're going to get to in a year, right? It's something that we're striving for and that we're working towards. Um, what the research will also say is when your pyramid is upside down, you have to focus on tier one. And that's really what we're trying to do, is to strengthen that tier one instruction so that we're truly identifying students that have those different learning needs to be able to intervene appropriately. Thank you very much. It would be helpful to see our data to, as a benchmark in this format to compare where, where we're moving. <laughs> Um, by comparison. So I can share with you foundationally tier one nationally as of 2022 across the nation at the end of third grade was 67 percent. State of Maryland last year was 48 percent. Baltimore County Public Schools um, as evidenced by MCAP, Baltimore County Schools was 43 uh, and nine tenths of a percent. So we're still uh, behind. Um, uh, the state, not that far behind, but still not where we want to be, where the goal overall is that you're about 80% in terms of tier one, and then, you know, you go lower in uh, tier two and tier three, but nationally, we're at 67%. Thank you. You're and welcome. it's helpful. I appreciate the um, descriptions of how we're building capacity, and those are all very exciting. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Other questions? Ms. Booker Dwyer? <laughs> So thank you, Ms. Shea and Dr. Kraft. You always have my favorite presentations. Oh. So, um, so I just have six questions for you. No. <laughs> Only six? It's a light night. It's a We're light ready. day. We're ready. <laughs> it's a light day. So my first question is around um, the Amira fall data. What is your y-axis? What are, are so 24 is that the number of students, the yes. percentage of? Percentage. Percentage, percentage of percentage. students. Percentage. Okay. Percentage. Thank you. And so is there a way to get more granular with this data? So when we see that 24% of students in kindergarten, is this overly represented is it overly representing one school, or is this looking at, um, or, or this, does this equally represents all the schools that took it? Like, I'm just wondering, like, how does the students, um, it, it, are we seeing it in certain schools? Are we seeing it with certain demographics of students? Um, is there a way to get more granular with that? Yes. So um, with, um, we can certainly, through the superintendent and Dr. DiDonato, uh, provide school level data. So we can get granular to see the schools. This is in the aggregate at the system level. So we're able to report on the percentage system wide. Uh, we do see differences in different grade levels. We also do see differences in um, different schools, depending on, and we see that in our KRA data as well, and some of the readiness for kindergarten. Um, so yes, this is the system level um, averages 
um, but we do have the ability to provide school specific. But but not only do we have the ability, we regularly um, disaggregate. Um, we look at schools, we look at student groups, we look at uh, demographics, um, and you know really interrogate the data and look and see what it's telling us, and also where we might need to provide differential support. Right, because just getting at kind of the root cause of why certain students are are not, especially at the kindergarten level, then that's just saying that they're not even coming in ready to read. So are these students in, are they in homeschool pre-K or are they in, you know, a, a, well, I won't go there. So yeah. then with the Dibbles data, so, okay, let's say you're a first grader and you're in red. Do we have Dibbles data from that student last year? Like, are these students being screened every year and are they moving at all? And could we see that trend to know that whatever we're doing is, is working or do they have a target that they're going <coughs> for? Yes to all the things. So the D for Dibbles stands for dynamic. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it stands for dynamic is because the standard shifts right. over time, beginning, middle, and end, and also which of the subtests is the priority in reaching this composite score. Um, so it's a both and. We can track the progress of students. We do look at where students ended the year and the year prior. We train uh, mm -hmm. reading specialists to look at where were they at the end of the year? Where are they at the beginning of the year? Knowing that that indicator is dynamic. So it's right. not a one for one, we can't right. say, but we are looking at that trajectory. And both Dibbles and Amira um, clock a trajectory yes. for individual students. So they let us know by student, what is the rate of progress that a student would have to make in each of these um, sub skills in order to um, change that overall composite score. And then both programs allow us, once we get to the mid-year, to analyze the summary of effectiveness of each of these tiers. So we will be able to look and say what percentage of students moved from being at risk to being emerging. What percentage of students moved from emerging to being at core. That gives us information about which of our programs are working well and how we might need to adjust. Okay. So with the, and I'm only looking at Dibbles because I know we have a longer trend of data with that. So do we see that our students are moving? Yeah, so, uh, oh, sorry, did you want to? No, please, go ahead. <laughs> um, so actually last year, uh, not that we were where we want to be, but um, the state actually had us present at a meeting because we had grown so much in Dibbles from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And so really moving students from the red to um, green or blue, um, core or core plus. And so we had an opportunity to share a little bit about and that we were kind of in that sweet spot of th the third year of our foundational skill implementation implementation um, and we also do see a pattern of you know which has been documented by research for you know nationwide where we do see this where they end in kindergarten right so then our first grade should look the same but we do see that summer slide when they come in we also know that it's not always you know a one-to-one -one match in terms of like that's the same exact student group but I can tell you when, when our students come in in the fall we aren't seeing where they left in the spring and so really starting to think about, well, what does that look like in the summer and what do we need to put in place so that we don't see such a significant decline where we're having to start over and try to get them where they need to be. Um, and then like Ms. Shea said, I just want to underscore that we really do look, I, we went out to visit 20 schools last year that had moved a significant number of students from the red, not to the yellow, to the green. And we, we went and we looked, we watched, we asked what they were doing, we asked how they were planning, you know, and what they did, because what we're trying to do is say, how are we moving students? What is in place to, to get those types of results? And so you're right, we do look at it over time, grade to grade, uh, to see what, what is working and what's not working and what we can learn from each other. Yep. Uh, so that's helpful. Um, and I'll just put in another plug um, <laughs> for the summer slide, perhaps year-round schooling. I'm just saying. Um, I'm just putting that out there. It's Booker Dwyer <laughs> um, with the FY25 budget. While year-round schooling is not an option, the good news uh, that we do have is that we are really taking a close look at our summer programs and what we're offering to our students, really moving in the same way that we're moving from optional professional development for our teachers to require the same thing for our 
students, particularly our students who are demonstrating the need. Uh, when we look at our data, for uh, looking at our KRA data, we have a little less than 39 percent of our kindergarten students who demonstrate readiness. And so we are expanding pre-K. As you know, that is uh, our commitment to our communities. So drastically expanding our pre-K offerings and even our three-year-old offerings to our students. But then what are we doing over the summer? Uh, what are we doing that might not be as um, summary and you know uh, <laughs> enough you know days with the break but what is uh, what does research tell us yeah. what does the evidence tell us in terms of what does that structure of summer school need to look like for students across the summer how long does it need to be how many days does it need to be for us to see gains so that we are not going back and forth every single year that we're able to see and sustain gains uh, for our students because we know that it also has an impact across all of their core subjects, their behavior, their self-confidence, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. No, I definitely think you all are on the right track and, and my kids hate it when I bring it up <laughs> at a board meeting. So I'll just, I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions or comments? Ms. Pumphrey? Sorry, I have one more question. That's I was okay. hesitant to ask, but I'm going to ask anyway. Um, so looking at some of this AMIRA data with the red, green, the chart with the red, yellow, and green, um, and I'm noticing that third grade has slightly higher numbers for the red and yellow compared to the other grades. Um, and we know that data shows that students need to be reading by the end of third grade to be successful. So my question is, um, do we or might we um, have any more intensive interventions for third graders to ensure that these students who are at risk at higher risk, especially in third grade, um, are receiving instruction that will push them to that level of being able to read by the end of third grade? It's a great question, and, and I, I, I really appreciate the way you added that at risk, because I just want to, again, reiterate, this is a screener. So all we know right now is the warning light has gone off. It's this next step that really tells us, and then the results of that diagnostic determine what level of intensive um, tiered intervention we provide for students. So we do have a tiered interventions at the elementary level, ranging from a double dose of that open court in a smaller group, because when you're thinking about intensifying tiers of support, sometimes it's just increasing the frequency, duration, and intensity of delivery by reducing the, the group size. So now I'm providing that double dose of phonics instruction in a group of one and two. We've talked a lot about how we do have training around open um, Orton-Gillingham strategies. We also we also have um, SIPs as another um, tier two intervention. So we have multiple programs that we work in collaboration with the ELA office and where appropriate, the Office of Special Education, although not every student that needs intensive intervention is a student with IEP, but there is uh, definitely a collaborative approach. Um, so we do um, think about at each grade level, second grade historically has been the area that we really need to flood our resources because of that transition from learning to read to, to getting into that um, content and knowledge building. So um, at every grade level, we take this uh, screening data we work through those diagnostic mm -hmm. pieces, and then we plan for that multi-tiered support of what those intensive interventions would look like. Um, at the school level, um, we do provide differentiated support about what will that mean for a third grader. We have interventions that we have in place even for students in fourth and fifth grade that might need them, mm -hmm. but we really do prioritize that third grade year because of the uh, content demands that will happen in terms of that disciplinary literacy when they move into the intermediate grades. Anything you want to add to that? Uh, and something that we're doing this year on a more uh, systemic level is we are actually tracking. So once a diagnostic has been given and it says they do need some supplemental instruction or intervention, uh, we are tracking that data in our system so that we can make sure that those students that popped up as needing some additional support are getting that support. And also, is that the right support? So if I put a student in that support, am I starting to see a difference when we do the mid-year screen? Um, and if not, was that the right intervention or the right intensity? And so th that is some of the work that we're doing is really around supplemental instruction. So I think we have the screening down, we have the diagnosis.
diagnostic down. And now the, the real work that we've been really uh, leaning in on this year is, so what does that mean when we talk about supplemental instruction and our intervention? And so we have really tried to partner with schools. That's actually what we did at our last reading specialist meeting. Um, and we're providing places where they can document that information uh, so that we ensure that we're giving every student that needs that additional support that they're getting it. I also want to reiterate really quickly the um, need to also focus on instruction. So in some cases, especially when you see, you know, a third of third graders, again, I mentioned before when Ms. Hen asked her question, you have to look at tier one instruction. Mm -hmm. So when uh, Dr. Croft talked about part of the end result, um, Karen Chenoweth, an author, talks about the most powerful question you can ask is, your kids are doing better than mine, what are you doing? And that's really what we tried to do. And one of the things that we found is schools that are using the Hegarty resources, which is a supplemental resource, it's this small little spiral, it's about 10 to 15 minutes around phonemic awareness, that was one of the magic pieces that we heard from schools. Every school had it, not every school was using it that way. So I just want to offer that some of what happens when we look at this data is also around informing mm -hmm. professional learning yes. and what happens in whole group instruction because that was one of the things we saw was a pattern in schools that were having tremendous success was that they were making sure to use that Hegarty resource for that phonemic awareness all the way up through third grade. So I just want to say that it's not always about putting a student in a different place, sometimes it is, but oftentimes it's also about informing that explicit first year of instruction. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation and for answer. Whoops. Um. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Kamenowski. I just um, wanted ahead. to comment, uh, not to single out those third graders even more, but you have to think about these third graders started kindergarten virtually. Thank you. For so there are, there are COVID babies. Yes. Right. 100%. We're, we're, yeah. we're yeah. leaning into that data, and, and you're right. And, and, not and an excuse, but it's the reality. It is the reality, and that means that we have work to do and supports to provide. Right. It's as much a screener for kids as it is for the adults that are working with the kids. Absolutely. So we just have to keep that in mind. So thank you for answering all of our questions yeah. and for the presentation. And I'm sure we'll get updates um, as the year goes on. The next item on the agenda, we've had some very patient people waiting in the back there. I see you back there. The next item is the report on the watershed public charter school renewal. And for that, I call on Dr. DiDonato and Dr. Jones and whomever else they are. Dr. Almendorf, I don't know if Ms. Whitney's coming or not. Nope, she's just back there. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Mm -hmm. Are we going to present? Okay, great. Good evening. I am Raquel Jones, Chief of Schools, and I am joined by my colleagues, Dr. Elmendorf and Dr. DiDonato, and we're here to uh, report out on the watershed, pu the watershed Public Charter School renewal. The purpose of our presentation is to share information regarding the renewal. On August 1st, 2023, Watershed Public Charter School, per BCPS's Superintendent's Rule 1600, submitted to BCPS a written notice of intent to renew its charter. This presentation summarizes the report that was written and submitted based on the BCPS review of Watershed Public Charter School that was required as part of the renewal request. Next slide, please. The report describes the purpose and process of the review, including a summary of findings for both the document review and site visit. The, metric the metrics used for the review were aligned with COMAR and the BCPS strategic plan that was in place on August 1st, 2023, when the intent to renew was submitted. And we may need to go back a slide, or you want to stay right here? Go back one, back go, one more go slide. Go back please. one more, I'm sorry. Got ahead a little bit. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, um, Dr. Jones. Upon receipt of the intent to renew, the Department of Academic Programs and Options convened a referral review team, or RRT, consisting of 10 BCPS central office professionals from the divisions, departments, and offices that are represented on this slide. Next slide. Next slide. There you go. Additionally, the executive director of the Department of Academic Programs and Options, which is me, and a supervisor from my department facilitated the planning, implementation, and analysis of the review. Next slide, please. This slide shows the timeline of the renewal process from the date the intent to renew was submitted until now. 
The vote on the renewal will occur at the December 5th board meeting. This gives board members time to reach out to BCPS staff and or watershed between now and then with any questions you might have to inform your decision on the 5th. Next slide, please. <coughs> The renewal review process can be broken into two sections, document review and site visit. This slide represents some of the commendations related to the document review that are outlined in the report. Highlights include commendations in the areas of student achievement, professional learning, financial profile of the organization, safety and security protocols, and the engagement of volunteers and the community. Next slide, please. This slide shows some of the recommendations related to the document review. In general, it was observed that there are some important practices in place at Watershed that could be more substantially documented, including professional development for new teachers and data related to the implementation of restorative practices. Dr. DiDonato will now share findings related to classroom observations. Next slide, please. Site visits included two main components, both classroom observations and stakeholder focus groups. Classroom observations were conducted for 20-minute periods in nine classrooms um, over with a, with a group of individuals observing within each classroom, completing a rubric that was agreed upon by both BCPS as well as Watershed Public, Watershed Public Charter School. Up on the screen, you can uh, see the findings of the classroom observations, the commendations, as you can see, things that were noted um, specifically and within the whole report there's some additional commendations, but some we highlighted, lesson objectives posted and reiterated by the teacher, which means students really understand the learning outcomes in the classroom as well as teachers demonstrating their knowledge of the standards, um, use of flexible seating in the, in the classroom, being responsible responsive to students, having them um, participate interactively and move throughout their classroom. Um, next slide, please. In addition to the findings about the commendations, some recommendations that were provided was um, looking at other modalities to support student learning and scaffolding instruction. What that means is that if we're providing uh, information auditorily, are we also providing it through other modalities, whether it's uh, visuals, other manipulatives, hands-on learning, so to provide that multi-modality approach to instruction. Um, and to really look at some opportunities for students, as Dr. Elmendorf noted, the student um, academic profile is a strength of watershed public public charter school, so really looking at the opportunities for um, advanced academic enhancements at the school, so really looking at how do we extend student learning there um, in lieu of not just more work, but really uh, deeper understanding or moving on to additional standards. Thank you, Dr. DiDonato. I just want to mention that the observers <laughs> um, in the classroom visits, they did acknowledge that their short visits were only what they called snapshots in time. Um, and that the slides that we're showing you and even the information in the report are um, commendations that are related to, commendations and recommendations related to the visit, but those, that was a snapshot in time for them. Um, the second component of the site visits was my favorite part, the focus group areas, especially when we met with the students. Uh, staff from the Department of Academic Programs and Options facilitated feedback sessions with five different um, WPCS stakeholder groups, and they were students, school leadership, faculty and support staff, the school governing board, and the parents and families. All focus group sessions focused on the areas dis, um, of discussion listed on this slide. Next slide, please. Participants in the focus groups had a lot to share. Their reflections are outlined in the report. This slide represents some of the major themes and a couple of direct quotes from those sessions. I want to point out specifically that students feel safe because, quote, there are adults everywhere throughout the building. Uh, another quote, teachers and staff, this is from students as well, teachers and staff, quote, go above and beyond to foster student learning. That was a fifth grader that said that. <laughs> and fifth and sixth graders have um, what Watershed calls intensives, and that um, students said that's to get help for subjects that they are struggling with. I will now turn the presentation over to our superintendent to share the recommendation. Thank you. After considering the recommendation of the BCPS Renewal Review Team, I recommend that the contract with Watershed Public Charter School Incorporated to operate Watershed Public Charter School to be renewed for a five-year term running from July 1st, 2024 to June 30th, 2029. 
I feel like it's a cliffhanger because we don't vote on that until December <laughs> 5th. So you have to stay tuned and come back right. for the, ne <laughs> the next one. So at this time, I'd like to invite the Watershed um, Board President, Sage Magnus, Executive Director, Jesse Leeson, and Principal Lori Whitney up to provide brief remarks. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Watershed is always happy to be invited to speak to you, and of course we're pleased to endorse the written recommendation for renewal. We don't have any factual corrections or substantive, substantive excuse me, I'm getting over the flu, um, concerns, but wanted to be available to answer any questions you might have. I'm not contagious, it's okay. <laughs> Just providing some no. Ms. Dominowski and Ms. Booker my doctor. Tired. They both just went backwards. <laughs> sorry, I should have kept that to myself. Yeah. Um, sorry, we have no concerns, but wanted to be available to answer any questions you might have. I also want to thank all of the BCPS staff involved with the renewal process, especially Dr. Elmendorf and Ms. Kirk, as this was really a big lift for everyone. I did want to take just a moment to highlight a few things from the report. Academic growth and achievement, as measured by the Maryland Report Card, continues to be a bright spot for Watershed. In the Maryland Report Card from 2022, Watershed received a star rating of 4 and a total earned percent of 69.8%. Watershed, as an environmental arts charter school, has demonstrated strong connections to related organizations, the community at large, and most importantly, the families and students at Watershed. The school is to be commended for being recognized for various accolades, including Charter School of the Year nominee, U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon School, a recipient of the National Fish and Wildlife Grant, and most recently being awarded the $1.2 million Renew America School Grant from the U.S. Department of Energy. I look forward to continuing a long and productive partnership with Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Um, yeah. As I'm sitting over here, I promise. I, if I get sick, I know who gave it to me. Um, so good evening, members of the board. My name is Sage Magnus Hill, and I have the privilege and honor of serving as the president of the Watershed Board of Directors. Um, so on behalf of the board, thank you to the BCPS uh, renewal review team for the diligent work done through the site visits, the review of, review of our very long application, and especially for our five-year renewal recommendation. Um, and I want to thank also Dr. Bennett, Dr. Elmendorf, Dr. DiDonato, and Dr. Jones for your continued support of Watershed. Watershed's partnership with BCPS is tremendously valuable to our community, and we always want to ensure that Watershed reflects well on BCPS and all the ways that public education serves students now and in the future. As a college academic advisor for under-resourced students, I know how vital access to quality public education is, and I'm grateful as a board member and as a parent for all that BCPS provides for our children. We are looking forward to continuing to build partnerships both with BCPS and our West Baltimore County community. Thank you for continuing the opportunity to try something different within public education that enables families to choose an environment that best suits their child's learning needs. Thank you again. Thank you. We welcome questions okay. if you have any yes. at this time. I think Ms. Um, Dr. Savoy. I don't have a question, but I just want to say I've been there, and it's one of the, I think it's Baltimore Public Schools best kept county public schools best <laughs> kept secret. It was phenomenal the visit, all the things that happened there, and I'm still waiting for my eggs. They do have chickens <laughs> there. And they promised me some eggs when I came back. <laughs> we forgot them. <laughs> but I mean, and it was just so so great to see parents working in the schools with their children. Everybody on point. It's a green school. You only use biodegradable things, and it was just fabulous. Please keep this school open for 20 more years. <laughs> we really appreciated your visit, Dr. Savoy. Yeah. It's lovely yeah. having you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> Other comments or questions? No. Yes, Ms. Booker-Dwyer. 
so I have not been to your school, but I've heard great things. I know a lot of families at your school, and they um, they absolutely adore it. And I just had a question. So I know you all right now are K six, right? And you're planning. So over the next five, this is renewed for the next five years. You're planning to incorporate go up to K eight by then, and so you have that whole plan mapped out and. Yes, um, we, we expanded to sixth grade this year. We will expand to seventh and then eighth grade in every year like following. So next year we'll have seventh grade, the year after we'll have eighth grade with curriculum development and input from community stakeholders. And when the students leave your school, so the fifth graders who left last year, are you following them? Are they successful in middle school? Do you know? So we have been only said farewell to one fifth grade class. Okay. Um, the other fifth grade class was expected to articulate to sixth grade this year. Mm -hmm. um, following them, no, but we did articulate them directly okay. with Baltimore County Middle Schools. And are your families, are they, do you have a sense that they are looking to stay there for middle school to sixth, seventh, and eighth, or? Yes. And so we do an, an interest survey mid-year to make sure that we know when the lottery to open and what seats are available. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Okay. I was trying to get the vote done, but we can't do it. So we will. Um, the, so the board is scheduled to vote on the charter renewal at our December fifth, twenty twenty three meeting. Um, thank you for being our audience tonight um, <laughs> at the board meeting and for your comments and all the hard work. It, I've been to a couple events at your school and it truly is um, a special place, so thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to our presenters. Yes, thank you for your support as okay. well. Um, where are we? Oh, look where we are, we're at the end. The next item on the agenda is board member comments and agenda setting. Um, so again, you can fill it in or take a pass. Ms. Dominowski, I'll start with you. Um, I, I've mentioned this in an email, but um, I, I wanted to say it publicly. And since we had so many questions tonight about Amira, if we could have a follow-up presentation on Amira with those you know, more deep dive into what's going on. And I think a lot of uh, parents and have questions and want to see how it's, how it's working or the, the future of it. So that's it. Thank you, Mr. Young, Ms. Frimpong, Ms. Stileski, Ms. Hen, Ms. Harvey. Just at the next Building and Contracts <laughs> Committee meeting. <laughs> Is? is December 4th at 4.30 virtually, and we invite all to attend. Thank you. Ms. Drummond, Ms. Pumphrey, Dr. Savoy. There is an equity meeting on Thursday at 5.30, at 5.30 to 7. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Yes, the audit committee will meet next Tuesday, uh, November 14th at 4.30. But I do have something I'd like to throw out from the agenda. Uh, item only if the majority of the board members were in agreement N now that the the calendar is taken care of for next year i think it would be extremely interesting to f for a number of different reasons and one of them is is uh staff retention and another would be uh you know the academic performance is to look at around the country and around the world at other options for the school year. Uh, whether the summer would be, you know, you know, just throwing out different things, you know, an optional fifth quarter. Uh, a four day week, if you talk to some people, uh, and with, with TABCO leadership, you know, the four day week is really attractive for retaining people and, and maybe recruiting people. That would, you know, a lot of different ways to look at that four day week. You know, would it be a longer school day? Would it be a longer school year? Uh, I think we, we need, and, and I, I, really, I'm the oldest member of this board, if I'm not mistaken, but I want to keep an open mind to look at other options on, you know, this is the way we've been doing this forever, but around this country and around this world, people are doing it differently, and there might be some, some uh, school systems or districts, independent districts that are experiencing a real, you, you know, phenomenal performance academic performance growth because of how they're looking at the school day and the school year and the and so I just think it would be really interesting to see what else is out there and and just you know if 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 the other board members are in agreement 
Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Booker Dwyer? You know I'm in agreement. I, I was going to say, did you two set that up? <laughs> and so um, the next Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee is at 4.30 on November 30th. And um, I don't have any other comments. Topics. OK, thank you. The last item on the agenda is announcements. This is an important note, especially for board members. The next meeting is on Monday, November 20th, 2023, um, at 6.30. So it's Monday. That's the week of Thanksgiving. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.